Get the fuck out of here, to Tommy. <laughs> <laughs> You're a funny guy. <laughs> oh, we're gonna have fun with this one. Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with this model showcase video for this 135th scale M60A2 Starship. The model in this video is built for my own personal collection and is not for sale and or purchase. However, like I often mention in these build videos, I frequently take on commission build projects from models ranging between 135th scale and 16th scale. For availability and pricing information, that info would be best by contacting me through the email address listed below, which is info at eastcoastarmory.com. This model here is deviating from the out-of-the-box configuration, which is a bit different compared to some of the other builds that I've touched upon and brought to this table on this channel. Generally, the model is built out-of-the-box primarily with, you know, some polishing here or there, and I also give the model a thorough in-box review. And although that is still going to be true for this video over here, I am going to be giving this thing a thorough in-box review, as well as, you know, walking you over some of the changes or some of the areas to watch out for for this particular build. This build goes further because I deviated from the stock original offering by converting this model from static display to motorization. In addition to that, I am also going to be putting this model up against the Dragon counterpart. And I'm going to be comparing and contrasting the two kits side by side, and I'm going to be giving my opinions on the subject on which one I feel is a better kit. So because of that, this is not going to be a short video by any stretch of the imagination. It's going to be a bit on the longer end, but that means more entertainment for you all. So stay tuned, sit back, grab some popcorn, watch this video in segments, or you can hit that little gear icon in the corner to speed my voice up. Regardless, there's going to be a mountain of stuff I'm going to be bringing to you for this project over here. So let's go ahead and get this one started. To start this video off, let's go ahead and take a quick walk around this model. And this vehicle here is the infamous Cold War era American main battle tank, the M60A2, also unofficially known as the Starship which, although it's not the official name, it has definitely stuck with this vehicle and will forever be associated with it until the end of time. The origins of this vehicle go all the way back to the late 1950s and the early 1960s. At this time, the generals were really coming at a crossroads and they weren't really sure about what the future of the main battle tank was going to be. It's a common recurring trend in military history and it's always one that seems to default every single time. But regardless, at this time, there was a large technological leap in missile technology. This is seen, of course, in jet fighters, but was also seen in various ground systems as well. And they weren't sure on what the main battle tank armament of the future was going to be. If it was going to be utilizing a standard rifled or smoothbore type cannon, or if it was going to utilize a missile type system. So during this time frame, you've seen a lot of highly technological type vehicles being developed and they were going to be adopted by the U.S. military. For the light tank role or the airborne tank we had the Sheridan and for the main battle tank role it was going to be the infamous MBT-70. Of course that's going to be a subject matter and has been a subject matter for its own independent video but regardless the MBT-70 was going to be the accumulation of all these brand new technological features to create the ultimate type tank. And although that vehicle was, you know, long in development and was going to, you know, really need a lot of R&D, the Army really needed something right now. And so at the same time, mind you, the M60A1 main battle tank was going to enter into production and was going to be fielded by the U.S. military as a replacement for the M48. The M60 is really nothing more than a product improved version of the M48. So many officials deemed that the M60 was already going to be obsolete because of the main armament thing, so they decided to go ahead and develop a further addendum to the M60, 
which was going to be the M60A2. The M60A2 was more or less just going to be a stopgap measure in order to fulfill the role of the main or the next generation main battle tank between the M48 Patton and also the M60A1 series, as well as the new MBT70. And the idea was that at a certain point, probably in the early 1970s, the MBT is going to enter into full production. And then finally, the Starship, as well as, or now we know the Starship, as well as the other legacy vehicles, can slowly start getting faded away. Uh, spoiler alert, that didn't happen, as which is kind of the case happened many times in military history. But regardless, that was the original intent for this system. Unlike the other accompanying vehicles, namely the M60 and the M68-1, the M68-2 was going to be utilizing the brand new Shalahi armament system. This was the exact same system that was being fielded by the Sheridan and was also going to be fielded on the proposed MBT-70. The Shalahi system was very unique because it basically straddles the fence between the two armament options. The main armament is the Shalahi missile, which was a guided missile, much along the lines of what we see today on things like the Javelin and, you know, other, and like the Hellfire, for instance. However, this was, you know, Generation 1 type technology. But in addition to the missile, the unit also was able to fire standard rifled ammunition. And this was done with some very clever engineering. With the way the the barrel worked was for the standard ammunition it was rifled so you would still get the same type of accuracy as you would with any other type of rifled cannon but for the missile there was actually a groove cut into the barrel and this helped align the missile when it was fired and it made sure that it was to be ejected from the barrel in the appropriate manner. Because of this new system, a brand new turret was designed, was intended to be utilized. Now, the turret of the M60A2 was actually originally, I believe, intended for another experimental type vehicle that didn't go anywhere, but the turret itself was then chosen to be placed onto the M60A1 hull, thus giving you the M60A2. The only difference between the hulls is that automotively the tanks were identical to the M60A1, but because of all the extra equipment needed for the Shalahi missile, more equipment was needed to fit inside the engine compartment, so the M60A2 hulls were unique because they had a large blister found on the lower rear portion of the vehicle. Outside of that, the two vehicles again were identical in terms of automotive as well as even with standard performance. Of course, the most iconic feature found on this vehicle is the unique, bizarre shape of the turret. This was something that was very different compared to the other contemporaries of the time, with not just in the U.S. Army, but also within NATO, as well as also in the Warsaw Pact. The turret had this very unique feature where the remaining crew were in a low-profile type format on the turret casting on each side, and then the center of the turret had this large channel which housed the armament as well as the other equipment. Of course, just like with the other American tanks, the commander had his own independent turret cupola with his own M82 50 caliber MG. One of the more interesting aspects that the M60A2 had was the ability for the commander to see a target, identify the target, and then he would hit the switch and the turret would automatically go to the target that he selected. This was something that was very ahead of its time and was actually a bit of technology that this vehicle had over its contemporaries. It has been theorized that with this vehicle having all this fancy technology in it, and also with the bizarre unorthodox shape of the turret, is how the name Starship just got associated with it from the various crews and other soldiers that were around these vehicles. And the name just stuck, and, you know, again, forevermore, this vehicle is known as the Starship. A pilot prototype was produced and submitted to the army to which then it got the rubber stamp of approval and this thing entered into series production the vehicle was supposed to enter in, in production in the early 70s however realistically production really didn't kick off until 1975 or so about 590 some odd units were produced in mass which is not you know too bad of a number and these vehicles were deployed in europe as well as also a number of them stayed stateside for training Upon fielding, there were some shortcomings of the design that were noticed. Namely, when the unit would fire its conventional ammunition, just like with the Sheridan, it would throw off the targeting for the missile system, and the whole unit had to have been recalibrated. Also, because this again is Generation 1 technology, it wasn't exactly the most durable or the most dependable systems that were available. After a little while, the vehicle still stayed in service in this format for a number of years. However, by the late 1970s, early 1980s, the Army really lost interest in the program and they decided to can it. When the 
project, or I should say when the vehicle was removed from service, the hull was still perfectly viable for other things, and some of them were converted to standard M60A1s, while others were actually repurposed and used for bridge layers. And it's easy to tell if the vehicle was a former m 68 2 is if you look at the rear section and you see that blister, you'll know exactly <laughs> that this vehicle was once a Starship. Before we continue with the video, let's go ahead and take a step back to when this model was first started in order to get a good idea on what the base starter kit supplies you with. And here's the model at the start of the build. For the base starter kit, I'll be utilizing this 135th scale M60 A2 Patton Starship kit from Academy. And this is actually a model that I've been wanting to do a build up of for a good period of time. Obviously on this channel, I do lots of builds from models in various scales. And generally the reason why I pick a certain model is because I like the subject matter. I think the kit is interesting and unique. And overall, it's going to be a pleasant experience and something to add to my collection. And although all of that is still going to be relevant for this kit over here, there is on this particular model going to be a little sprinkling of spite and there's going to be a few reasons for that and you'll see as the video goes on. However, going back to the kit over here, this is a relatively recent release from Academy. These kits here were released by Academy I want to say 2016 or so, around thereabouts. So it's a relatively recent release and these kits, by the most part, are still relatively easily tracked down. This particular kit here is a really recent addition to the stash. I picked it up about a month or so ago. So it's been sitting in my filming area. As you can see, there's like no dust on the surface, which is a bit unique for the models that I typically do videos of. And this one here I picked it up from Amazon.com. These models, like I touched upon before, are still relatively easily tracked down and can be had anywhere between 30 to about 50 some odd US dollars. In my opinion, this build here is a bit overdue as I've been wanting to acquire one of these kits now for some time and I figured, you know what, I might as well get on it sooner than later because occasionally sometimes there are kits out there that are seemingly all over the place and then when it comes time to actually purchase it, they dry up like the Sahara. So I went ahead and purchased the model, which it went ahead and promptly was then delivered. Now, the Academy M60 A2 is a relevant kit just for my own personal collection because, one, I love M60s and the A2 Starship is a very cool one at that. However, this is actually a very interesting kit in its own right because this is the first time Academy went ahead and released a M60A2 variation of the M60. And why this is relevant is because if anyone knows a thing or two about Academy's past history and how the company was first started and some of the original kit releases that they came out with, you will know that back in the day when Academy was a startup, Basically what they were doing was they were taking their tank kits specifically from Tamiya and just making straight up copies of them and selling them with a lower price point but under the Academy labeling. Obviously this is something that is less than above board. However, this is what Academy did throughout the 1980s time frame and up until really the early 90s in which at that point they decided to move on from that and begin tooling up their own original tooling kits. There are actually several examples of these Academy Tamiya knockoff type kits that are found on the ECA channel as I built several of them in recent years. And Academy would do this up until the 1990s time frame where they would start taking some of the existing molds of the kits that they have, which are knockoffs, and they began making it more their own where they would modify them, improve the detailing on them, and make them more Academy. And in recent years, Academy completely departed from that type of business model and started tooling up all original tooling kits, such along the lines would be like their M551 Sheridan, which is all 100% new tooling, and it's not related to the original Sheridan release that they came out with in the 80s, which was a Tamiya copy. Well, with this kit over here, and with others similar to this, this is more like the former, where they would take some of the Tamiya tooling and make it their own. And that's where this kit to me is very interesting. You see, this kit's tooling technically dates back to 1970. And this is important because this is gonna reflect on several of the details that are found on the molded surfaces. So back in 1970, Tamiya released the M60A1. In fact, I've done a couple examples of a Tamiya M60A1, and yes, they can be found on the channel. 
Regardless, Tamiya came out with that kit, and then in the 1980s time frame, they went ahead and revised the tooling on it, creating their M60A3, as well as their other M60A1 Marine Corps version with the reactive armor. Academy, during the late 1980s time frame, took the US Marine Corps variant, and they went ahead and made copies of it, and that kit is sold still to this day as the Academy M60A1 Rise, which by the way is an excellent kit and I would love to go ahead and do a video on one at some point in the future. Regardless, what Academy went ahead and did though was they at some point decided to take that tooling, which was improved tooling that Tamiya did in the 80s, that was originally based on Tamiya tooling from the 70s, and they went ahead and polished up even further. And oddly enough, the Academy rendition of the M60 kits are arguably the best ones out there, with the exception of, you know, in latter years, the newer tooling kits that started coming out from some of the more modern companies like TACOM. However, for the longest time, the Academy M60A1 was one of the best, if not the only, but it was the best option out there for a detailed M60A1 kit in 135. And I've said it before and I'll say it again, in many respects, the Academy kit corrects lots of errors and mistakes that were present on the Tamiya rendition because the Tamiya rendition kind of stopped short from fixing all the mistakes that were originally tooled up back in 1970. Now, I know that sounds really convoluted of a backstory, but it's all really relevant. Because after Academy went ahead and or not really perfected, but improved the M60 to that point in the 90s, they basically just kept that hull and recycled it on many occasions and re-released it on several other kits. And that's where we have this one here. Some other notable examples would be several renditions of the Israeli Magach, or as they like to call it, the M60 Blazer. And there is another version that has the Saber turret. It's like a reactive armor package for the M60. Again, that's still a recent release, but the tooling for the main hull, the turret, and, and the running gear date back to the Tamiya improved variants. And this leads us to 2015. At this time, there was this newfound popularity in the patent-based series of vehicles, which was absolutely awesome. Finally, all these companies were getting off their collective asses and producing these vehicles, but with newer tooling options. Prior to this era here, if you wanted an M68 2 Starship in 135th scale, no less, the only option available for you at the time was to track down one of the many original release or re-release variants of the Tamiya M68-2 Starship, which tooling dates back to 1974. And although that is an excellent kit, and I have several in the stash, and yes, they will be making an appearance at some point in time on the channel, needless to say, by the 2010s time frame, 1974 tooling kits were really beginning to show their age. So the market was really ready for some new blood for some of these variants that were going to be released. Some notable kits that were released during this time would have been the Dragon M103A1, M103A2, even though those are a bit controversial. You had the Dragon M48A1, the M60, their own M60A2 Starship, and then from AFV Club, you had their versions of the M60A1 and the M60A2, to name a few. So, there were quite a few M68-2 Starship options available at that time, which again is fantastic. The more options available for the consumer, the consumer always wins. So like I touched upon before, prior to Academy releasing this kit here, they never released an M60-A2 Starship. Which means that the tooling on this is not just going to be a copy and paste from Tamiya, for the turret components, and you're going to be getting 100% new tooling for certain aspects that make this vehicle into an M60A2. However, you still have several of the legacy components, namely the hull and running gear, which are from the 1990s, which again are just improved variants from 1970 tooling. And we'll touch upon that once I go ahead and finally crack open this box. Starting with the box art and graphic design, here you can see the composition in view. It's just a M68-2 Starship in a nice peaceful setting in a green grassy meadow. And there's nothing really exciting going on. It's not like there's 
explosions or anything like that, which again would be actually pretty appropriate for this pattern of vehicle. The M68 II is a Cold Warrior. It didn't exactly participate in any conflicts or battles or anything like that. The vehicle is mostly just used, you know, maybe in Reforger or deployed in Europe, and then eventually phased out as the whole A2 concept wasn't really deemed to be a success. As for the composition itself, well, the vehicle is quite appropriately painted with a Merc camouflage scheme. The quality of the illustration is decent. I definitely see that the illustrator has a Photoshop filter to get those little grassy effects. I remember messing around with those in Photoshop in college, and, and it was actually kind of fun to do, but regardless, it works pretty well for the, the setting as a whole. And as I mentioned before, you know, the box art is pretty good for what it is. As for the remainder of the graphic design, at this time, Academy was spicing things up a bit by going with this type of geometric pattern, utilizing the corners of the box and the bottom portion that we have right over here. Typically on older school Academy kits, the logo would be right here in the upper corner, a la like Tamiya, but they were mixing up at this time. Continuing with the graphic design takes to the end tab where we have a vertical type format, kind of like a bookend ordeal. We have the kit number, which is 13296 for those who are interested. Nice little thumbnail of the vehicle, or I should say of the vehicle's illustration. And one thing that's really neat is that this one, they actually give you the dimensions, which oddly enough, a lot of people always ask me in my videos, oh, what's the dimensions? Like it's 135th scale, but they still want the width and length of the model and the height for some reason. And honestly, I don't ask me that because I never give out that information, not for any personal reasons or anything. It's generally because the model is in storage or, you know, it's on display. And I just don't have the time to grab a pair of, you know, measuring tape and measure it out for you. So if that's something you want to ask, sadly, I'm, I'm not going to be able to oblige. But for those who, who care for the A2 from Academy, there you have it right there, clear as crystal. So that should answer that for those type of people. Which, by the way, to this day, I still don't understand why that's even relevant. But regardless, on this side over here, we have some thumbnails of a built example of this kit, which I got to say, looks very, very handsome. It's a very attractive looking tank, specifically with the Merc camo scheme. And some vehicles, by the way, they just it just works with a Merc scheme and the Starship is most definitely one of them. I mean, the model looks so good that even with its Achilles heel, which I could definitely see in these photographs and I will be touching upon that once I crack open the box and it's partially where some of the spike comes from for this build, even with the Achilles heel that it has, the builder was still able to do a good enough job as they possibly could. However, it's still poking its head out even through this excellent rendition that we have here. So we'll be touching upon that once I crack the box open. However, the kit's also really cool is that it gives you a set of photo etch for the mesh work on the bustle. This is a very nice addition that this kit does give you. And it's something that is generally typically seen on contemporary super era, or I should say super kit type models. And the fact that this kit gives this to you, it's definitely an added bonus. One thing a bit unique is that the end tab on the opposite side is a different format. Generally, it's just copy paste or maybe a mirror image. But this one here, we have a larger portion of the box art. And we also have another picture of the built example with the verbiage around it. Again, you don't really see this all the time. I think the way this was intended, if I'm going to get into the head of the graphic designers here, is that this side of the box is intended to be stacked this way. And this side of the box is if you're in a shop and you stack them vertically. So, you know, it depends on the hobby shop or the shelf type setting. It depends which end tab you actually want to have displayed to the potential customer. Interesting thing to factor in. On this side over here, we have just some corporate information. 14 plus of age, which I'm definitely more than capable of being able to build, hopefully. Made in Korea, not in best Korea. It's made in regular Korea. Of course, the copyright is 2015. So now with all that out of the way, let's go ahead and open up the model. This is the first time I've opened this kit up, so I have a rough idea on what the kit contents are from just seeing random pictures on the net over time, but this is my first time to even get a glimpse of this model, so as far as I know, this thing could be intact or it could be a amorphous glob because it melted at some point and I got stuck with it. So with the wrapper off, first the box is nice and matte finish. It's kind of like the newer kits that Italery makes with that type of a card of, or stock of paper and also with the type of ink Otoni used. It's a bit, you know, interesting to point that out. So 
It's a tight box. Let's see. Hopefully it's not melted. And huzzah, it is most certainly not. So this is going to be a bit of a learning experience for us both. Here we have a nice little warning thing telling us to check the parts thoroughly, making sure nothing is lost. So that's interesting. That's a nice little quality control assurance. And the first runner takes us to the turret. And I gotta say, this is all 100% new tooling. This is not recycled tooling from anything else. As far as I can tell, they did not just take the old school Tamiya one and just polish it up and, you know, repackage it like they've done on some of the older kits, like the Sergeant York comes to mind. This is 100% new tooling, which is good. That's, that's a good thing. Okay. You have that nice little divot right there in the back so that the driver can actually open up the hatch. See the geometry on the turret? It looks like an M68 Starship. There is cast texturing molded in. It's a bit faint, but if anyone has seen any of the cast texturing found on the Tamiya tanks from the contemporary era, it's basically, you know, about similar to that. Hatches are a separate item, which they were, to be fair, on the original one, but it's just something to point out. Hatches look pretty good. I like the geometry found on them. The tarplin, or no, these aren't, I believe these are the gypsy racks are molded very fine, which means this is definitely gonna make assembly a bit tricky. And I can tell you right off the bat, if you're a beginner, don't, don't, don't even think about it. <laughs> Straight off the bat, this is gonna be something that's gonna take a little bit of finesse to go ahead and properly assemble, but we'll see how that pans out. These smoke grenade launchers look excellent. They have the appropriate curve to them and they are rendered in the loaded condition with the little rubber caps on and they have their little chain retention little uh, hooks present, I believe. Again, excellent detailing. Everything is molded in this forest green plastic, which is quite typical for it or I was just gonna say a tallery, for Academy tank kits, specifically some of their newer ones. I've seen this plastic used on many kits in the past, and overall the quality plastic on these Academy kits were always really good. At the bottom of this bag, we can see our first recycled component, which is a set here of vinyl poly caps. And if anyone has ever built the M60A1 or the Sergeant York kit, it's the exact same mold that produced these, only in contemporary releases, they are molded in this Force green color here, as opposed to that olive drab color, which is generally find on, or found on some of the older Academy releases from years past. The next runner consists of all new tooling, which if I could go ahead and open this bad boy up. And this is cool. So we have a brand new replacement rear grill area, because if anyone knows a thing or two about the Starship, the lower hull was a little bit different compared to your standard M60 where they need this extra bulge in this section over here in order to accommodate some extra equipment that was required to power the, the turret functions. The piece geometry wise looks very nicely done. The grill work is decent. You know, it's more than capable for the task at hand in, and it's basically on par with some of the other kits you'll see of the same era. We have two options of barrels, which is a nice touch. We have the early version with the straight tube and the version with the bore evacuator. We have some other options here for those boxes that are on the tail fender portion of the 60. We have a new front driver's hatch, which has some added cast texturing to it. Air filter boxes look to be pretty good. I mean, it's, I don't think it, I think they are definitely revised compared to the older ones due to some of the extra fittings that are found on these ones that are absent on the older releases. But again, that's more true to form to the vehicle as a whole. We have this really cool protector here that's molded in to protect the cupola. And I always love when runners do this or when companies do this with their runners. It's just, I don't know, it just makes it for just an interesting experience I find. We have the searchlight mount right there. That little rate, I believe this is a laser rangefinder piece of equipment that's mounted above the mantlet. If I'm mistaken, pretty sure some vet out there will definitely point that out to me. The air intakes over here for the air filters are blocked off. On the older kits, these were actually separate items that you glued on and you could hollow them out. I will be hollowing them out here with a Dremel with a pin vise, but 
the I think I would have actually preferred these as separate pieces because you had you get better geometry of the elbow that way. But again, we'll, it does make for a simpler build. I will say that. Some more searchlight components. The searchlight appears to be the exact same one from the previous releases in the past. They just basically, I guess, took the the CAD file or whatever tooling they had of this component, just rinse, wash, and repeated it for this runner here. Or at least that's what it looks like to me. The front portion does look to be new because it has better detailing on it compared to the older ones that I've seen on, again, uh, some of the other Academy older kits that I've come across in my, in my passage. I like the little handles right there molded on. They, or I should say on the sprue, they are to scale. They may be a little tricky to deburr and remove, but we'll see how that works once I get to that. Overall, you know, decent quality. Definitely, it's a, it's a decent quality kit. On the inner portion over here, we still have the motorization hookup tab, which is something that is how on these patent kits, or these Tamiya pattern ones, yes, Tamiya pattern ones, they clip into this section over here so you could remove the upper hull, which may or may not be relevant for this build here once I actually dig into it. Okay, so the next runner here is actually a repurposed runner. This was from a Israeli pattern of M60A1, where on that kit they recycle, or I should say they depict the tank with the Israeli modification of swapping out the American tracks with the Merkava steel tracks. And when they did that, they also have to change out the sprockets, and that's the tooling that you see here. Which is interesting. We have those two rear guard plates that go... that. Protect, that are attached to the tin work. And it's a unique feature found on these patents. We have the front hooks and the, and the rear hooks, and the front hooks here have that little hole integrally drilled out, which is, you know, that's something on the older kits was you always have to do with a pin vise, but hey, that, that's nice that they get that, you know, they give you that little bit. And we have the little clip here for the rear portion of the hull, so it could clip onto that tang that I mentioned before. Oh, another thing I like are the hinge details, which Again, on the old school Tamiya ones, we're always missing, so that's nice. And that's really it from what I can see from the new tooling stuff, by and large. So now it looks like we're hitting the recycled bits of the M60 parts from the Legacy releases. So here we have a runner that consists of many upper hull or upper turret components. For instance, we have here the cupola, which obviously is not going to be used, so maybe I'll make another tonk out of it like I did with the last one. Uh, we have handrails for the side of the A1 turret. We have that really cool small searchlight, which is a interesting bit of detail that was only released by Academy. And this was one of the perks of getting an Academy over the Tamiya option, from what I can remember anyhow. Travel lock, we have here the headlights, which again, even though they the tooling on them is pretty old, they still do the job those infamous storage bin lids for the side of the hull, and also a bunch of other hull components like the handles for the bin lids and those little iconic bit of detailing for those hooks that are welded to the side portions of the lower hull, which an M60 is just loaded with. This sprue over here contains more M60 bits. We have here the old school original pattern motorized sprockets from the ancient Tamiya kit from 1970. In fact, this whole runner here is basically 1970 Tamiya, just copy paste. Like literally everything on here is Tamiya with the layout and everything. We even have some of the components for the motorization, the tow hitch, and those side sections, which for some reason on the M48, they decided that they didn't need to make these as a separate part, but on the M60, nope, you were going to be gluing those on and you were going to be doing body work. So, coming attractions, we have a, a cool little 1970s tank figure. And some more hull component shock absorbers, bump stops, the front toe points without the little hole drilled in. The only addition though that Academy did add to this, I will say this, is the blank firing unit over here, which gets mounted over the barrel when during a military exercise. I think it's like for Miles Gear, if I'm not mistaken. And you would always see these clamped over the uh, the, the bore evacuator, if I'm not mistaken, on an A1. But that is, that is a new bit of equipment that Academy added to this runner. And also Academy built up these sections over here, these little wings. Those aren't found on the old school Tamiya tooling. 
And we got a little loose little bit of plastic running around. This looks like a front idler, or I should say a front roller plug. Leave that over there. So the next thing is the upper hull. And this is probably, actually the upper and lower hull is what I find laughable when I mentioned in the pre-video bumper where some individual claimed that this model here was more accurate than the Dragon. And this is just, it couldn't be further from the truth. Here goes the upper hull for this 2000 release M68 2 Starship. And if anyone knew a thing or two about these kits, this hull it has been recycled since 1993. In fact, this hull still has 1970 Tamiya features on it. This is what sets this model back and prevents it from truly being in the league with those other super kits from Dragon and also AFV Club. The big thing, or I should say the, the biggest ding that's present on the Academy Tooling M60 hull, or top hull specifically, is with the tin work, okay? If we look at the tin work here, on an M60, the tin work is fastened to the side and we have these support arms that come out and give it rigidity. On the original release of the M60 by Tamiya, they molded them in in these following locations and this is what they look like on the 1970 release. Now obviously Tamiya did this because it's simple, it cuts down immensely on the part number, and it also cuts down immensely on the complexity. However, Tamiya never went ahead and fixed that. They kept it since 1970, and in the 80s, they basically altered and, and, and refined other aspects of the tooling, but left those in place. Academy, when they acquired the M60 and, and took it further, they went ahead and still left these components as they were originally. So these sections over here are effectively 1970 tooling. Now, if you, now, now first and foremost, that's not a problem. They were built into the model, they paint well, and the model's fine. It builds into a nice example of an M60. However, if you're gonna compare this to some of the newer tooling kits from the other companies I just mentioned, this is where this kit's gonna start showing its age. On these supports, if you look at a real M60, they are perforated. They have unique geometry to them. There's a mounting point with fasteners on them. And these details are just not present with the stock molding found on this upper hull. In fact, there were aftermarket sets out there from Edward and others where it allowed the builder to amputate these sections here and replace them with the aftermarket ones in order to polish this up into something that has greater detailing. So, all of those details I just mentioned are stock with those other models. The Dragon ones, these are separate molded pieces. In fact, the whole tin work is a separately molded piece, so you get a nice accurate hull design, nice accurate hull shape. The tin work assembles separately, so you have some nice seams where they would be present. And the supports are the proper scale. They have the proper perforations, the proper fasteners. They are just better in every single way. So to compare this and proclaim that this is better or more accurate than the Dragon one, is laughable, quite literally laughable. Nothing personal with the kit. Again, I'm gonna enjoy myself building this thing. I'm gonna build it with these stock sections in place. However, I have no illusions on which, uh, on where exactly this kit sits in the totem pole. One other thing I wanna mention is that because Academy has recycled this tooling here for so many releases, that it is just littered in artifacts and suggestion points, much along the lines like you see with Italery kits, where on their Sherman kits, it's just got all these suggestive points all over the place for all the different Sherman variants that they made, and you, the builder, have to make sure that you amputate and polish away the ones that are not needed. And that is also true for the Academy M60. You could see, hopefully, when this thing comes into light, that there's little boxes, little lines, there's two lines over here in different directions, there's a line over there. I mean, it's, it's, it's just like zigzag with lines. And, and every time I build a newer version of an Academy M60, it seems like they keep adding more and more stuff to it. <laughs> so it's kind of funny in that regard. However, again, I know exactly which lines are gonna be kept and which need to go, but this is something that the builder needs to pay attention to because they could just skip past this and you know, the model's still build, but once you paint it and weather it, you're gonna be in for a rude awakening because these 
little suggestion points are just going to jump out at you and it's going to ruin your build. And this is what separates a good build from a build from someone that doesn't really have that much experience. On the topic of recycled parts from 1970, takes us to the lower and also a mantlet for the turret, which is cool. The mantlet's nicely rendered. It's got all the little rimples in for the canvas and great. So now you have to come to the dilemma on do you model this vehicle with or without the tarpaulin. So that's something I'm gonna to touch upon when I get back to it. On the lower hull, again, this is where the kit starts showing its age. And also it's again where I keep seeing Academy adding more stuff to a legacy component. So this here is something from Academy from the 1990s. But again, it has its elements to the 1970s. When Tamiya first designed this hull, they designed it to be motorized. And when they did, they had these really large cutouts in the back section over here. Well, that was one of the biggest dings found on these old Academy models, or I should say old Tamiya models specifically. And one of the improvements that Academy did, to their credit, was they deleted the bulk of those really large cutouts. Namely, those really two large ovals found in this section over here, and that little slit line for the power switch. However, Academy didn't remove everything, and you'll see that they left in place right here the oval cutout for the gearbox. And that's because Academy themselves would periodically re-release their M60 or their M60 derivative type kit in a motorized or a two-way wire remote fashion. Generally, it's the latter. You see more of those than anything. And that's why on the inside portion over here, we have the rails for a gearbox. The gearbox rails have changed over time. From what I can see, I remember on some of the other releases, it was slightly different. And there are some other slightly different things I'll touch upon in a second. One other thing that's an appendix and it's a carryover from the original 1970 Tamiya kit is with this little square cutout that we have here. If you don't know what that is, you've never built a Tamiya M60. And if you didn't, do it because it's a great kit. But if you ever built that kit, you'll know that it gives you this ancillary bit of detailing, which is this little driver compartment section where you have a plate that gets glued to the section over here. There's a chair and the infamous fire extinguisher. It's on all of the Tamiya M60s. Well, on the Academy kit here, that little feature was pitched. However, the little cutout for that little assembly is still present and it stayed with this kit all throughout its years. Also on that note, you can see it has a little plus and minus location right over here. And on the original M60 kit, this would be where the batteries would go for the motorization. But even though this one no longer seems to have the bulkhead and switch units in place, it still has the power icons for some reason. That's okay. Um, but one thing that I noticed that this kit has that's different from the other Academy M60 releases that I've done in the past is the center portion. You notice that there's this big square cutout in this portion over here, and this is something that I haven't seen on some of the other M60 kits released by Academy in years past, specifically the ones from the 1990s timeframe. What's also unique is that this same feature was found on their M48A3 model and their Sergeant York model, only it was a giant circle, and I touch upon that in those videos. That giant circle was there for the two-way wire remote wire to come out and to run along the bottom portion and just makes it a little bit easier to, to handle. I have a strong hunch that that's exactly what this is for, but at least on the M60, Academy gives you this little plate right over here that's molded into the front, which obviously gets installed in this section if you intend to build it as a static model. Oddly enough, they don't give you, or at least I'm not seeing from the parts on the runner, a plug for the gearbox hole, so that is something to consider. And since I have the opportunity, I might as well compare this version of the Academy hull with an older kit that I've had sitting in the stash for about 10 years. And I gotta say, it looks like I have a small little mishap with what I mentioned before, where I talked about the rails and also the center portion. You can see that on this circa 2010 issue of the kit, it has the exact same mold. It's done with the exact same tooling, just the plastic is slightly different, which by the way, there's also another common plastic that, it, that Academy has used over time. However, if we can go back to the M60A1 Rise with the M9 dozer blade build, that one did not have these provisions in place and the entire hull was basically holeless with the exception of the 
gearbox mounting hole in the back. So that is something that just uh, caught me off guard on this one here. But as you can see, it's the exact same tooling that they've been using on this model for at least the last 10 or so years. Also in the bag over here, we have a length of nylon string. Obviously this is to be used for the tow cables, which would be mounted to the sides of the turret. More on that as the video goes on. And this leads us to the second big donkey punching, build destroying feature found on this kit. And if you know a thing or two about my videos, you'll know exactly what I'm going to be talking about right now. Yes, in Academy's infinite wisdom, they decided to give this model individual link and lane track because they're morons. I don't know what the hell they were thinking. Well, actually I do, and I'm gonna to touch upon that in a second. But they decided that, hey, even though we have a mold for single piece vinyl tracks that are awesome and we've used for the last 30 plus years and there's no cost overruns with that at all, let's go ahead and reinvent the wheel and kneecap this model right over here. So with the parts taken out of the bag, you can see that Academy's doing the cost cutting procedure of molding the tracks with the wheels. And this is something that's been done on a lot of kits in the past. And it's one done, by the way, spoiler alert, not because it looks realistic, it's because it's a cost cutting feature. Individual link link tracks do not look realistic. They never did, they never will. The only reason why companies give them to you is because of economics. This saves money as opposed to molding things in two different materials. So you have one mold, right here you could spit out a ton of these things, one after the other, and it costs you pennies on the dollar, as opposed to the other way, which now you have to add an extra component, you have to have extra mold, you have to have machines running an extra long period of time now just to fulfill the same order, when you can utilize this right here. This is not a feature that's good. This is a feature of, of a company who's trying to cut corners. And anyone who says otherwise is doing so purely out of cope. These tracks are shit. They always were, they always will be. And this is why I never purchased this kit in the past. As soon as I saw that this kit had these links, I basically was this image right here. Another thing to mention is that when Academy released this kit over here, they also went ahead and were going up against other M68 twos that are on the market, namely Dragon and AFV Club. And guess what? Both of those companies give you single piece vinyl. So you can really see that the Academy kit was basically the small kit on the block in this regard. Normally I'd go ahead and wing these tracks on screen, but since I kind of need the suspension components, I'm gonna refrain from doing that for the time being. Starting with the track detailing, I'm not gonna go over this fully because obviously I don't, I'm not gonna use these, these pieces. So let's go ahead and look at the surface. And before he wants, and for the people out there who proclaim that these tracks are great, which they're not, spoiler alert, but for those ones who claim that they're highly detailed, yeah, you might wanna take another look because the Chevron thread suck. They're too thin. They're really, really flat. A Chevron track like this would look like this after tank had a ton of mileage on it, and even then, it would be all chipped up and nicked up and stuff. It just wouldn't look like this. This is just a crap molding. No way around it. So that's all the time I'm gonna spend evaluating these hunks of crap. Let's go ahead and look at the wheels. The wheels are the aluminum pattern wheels and basically are the same tooling as the ones that were released on the Legacy kits. That's a good thing. Those wheels were really good, and funny thing is that there are several different generations of Academy M60s, where some of the early ones had just straight up copied wheels from the Tamiya, although the wheels were repaired from the Tamiya because on the original Tamiya M60 kits from 1970, the hubcap was a separate mold apart and it was a polycap. And basically you would put the wheel onto the axle and you would install the polycap and it gives you the detailing and also keeps the wheel nice and retained. It works, but detailing wise, it leaves a little room for improvement. When Tamiya themselves would redesign their M60 kit in the 80s, they would go ahead and basically go with the wheel pattern from the M48, but that wheel would have the hubcap integrally molded on. So Tamiya did fix that on their M60 A1 kit. Not the A3, the A3 still has the same exact old school polycap situation as the 1970 kit. However, the Academy kit here, they decided to revamp the wheels, giving it 
with the same design as the Tamiya M48, but with the surface detailing of the aluminum cast wheel, which would be appropriate for an M60. And as you can see, the wheels look really, really good. The details on them are perfectly suffice and will definitely work into a nice usable piece. The inner wheels do have their little ribs integrally molded on. And you can also see the detailing found on the idlers. Or uh, the rollers, I should say. The idler is just the same wheel on the front. But regardless, on the sprocket, they also went ahead and retooled the sprocket. You see, the original sprockets were intended to be motorized. Even the second generation sprockets were intended to be motorized. So on this version here, they decided to omit that altogether, and they give you this design where instead of having that cool little hexagon molding right there in the center, they just have a standard little stem so that this will slide onto the axle as much as it would on any other static model kit. The surface detailing of the sprocket are, you know, quite customary and they're good, they do the job. Although they still don't have the mud slits in them, which again is a common folly seen on just about every single M60 kit that I've personally come across. At the moment, I've basically done a 60 from every company with the exception of TACOM and AFV Club, so perhaps they have that corrected? Only time will tell. I will say, though, that this is not necessarily an inaccuracy, as I often mention, because the sprockets that were supplied, or I should say the hubs that were supplied by a certain vendor, did not have the mud slits in them, so it's not necessarily something that is inaccurate. But chances are, or I should say, more often than not, the sprockets do have the mud slits. But again, you could build it stock out of the box without the mud slits and still be okay. And that's it for the plastic. And the last thing I want to review on the kit is some of the extras. So we have here a set of water slide decals. They look to be decent quality, however, I have stated in the past I've had some mixed results with Academy water slide decals, but to be fair, those were very old kits, and hopefully in the last number of years or so, they improved their decal quality. And by the looks of the paper over here, this seems to be on par with other contemporary models. So we'll see how that pans out as the build goes on. The remainder of the fret is the photo etch, and the photo etch is excellent. It's silver photo etch as opposed to just the brass colored stuff. And it looks like it's on par with the PE that was supplied with the Dragon M60 A2, which as I recall from that video was also a nice feature and was nicely rendered by Dragon. The set gives you a little bit more besides just the photo etch for the mesh, and there are a few other components on there. And as for what they are, well, it's hard to say right now. We're definitely gonna find out as the build continues. Moving down further, we have some more literature, namely some oh, components for the PE, and apparently that a lot of that PE is for the searchlight, which is interesting, as well as other amenities found on the turret, and it's actually really nicely laid out and illustrated over here. Good job, Academy. Here we have a nice little parts layout of the kit, much along the lines of what Tamiya and Academy have done in the past. Uh, just some basic modeling tool suggestions and t and tricks on how to build models. To me, it also does stuff like this, and it's always, this is generally something you see done by the Japanese companies and also the Korean companies, which is, you know, it's kind of cool. It's, I don't know, it's just, it's just good marketing. Nice showmanship. And here we have the actual instructions themselves. The quality of the paper is really good. That's the first thing that jumped out at me. And the quality of the CAD drawings also look like they'll be just fine. Yeah, that's that's not going to happen, but regardless, other than that, the model looks to be something that's going to be built pretty, well, pretty standardly, I should say. The instructions look like they're pretty good. Of course, if there are any misprints or anything noteworthy, I'll be sure to mention that towards the latter half of the video. The model also has a nice little Merc color thing right over here. And at least they tell you what parts on the track are metal and what parts are rubber. That's nice. I'm not going to use them. Well, I mean, I am going to use that technique, but just not on these piece of crap tracks. And there we have the remainder of the illustration, which looks really nice. I always did like these type of illustrations. Very Tamiya-ish, and uh, yeah. Also, there are some Merc camouflage resources out there on the net, and I'll definitely talk about that towards the end of the video where I'm talking about paint jobs. So as I touched upon earlier, part of the reason why I took on this project was because I do have a little bit of spite and resentment for this kit. And some of that spite is really more or less 
do impart to the tracks that we have right here. Obviously, these tracks, in my opinion, destroy this otherwise excellent kit, and I am the furthest thing from a fan as one can possibly imagine for this pattern of track. And that is generally the case with all individual Lincoln Link track supply kits. However, for this one, it is a little bit more irritating for me personally because they're taking a model which was intended and originally designed to be motorized and basically cucking it with these tracks that we have here. And that is something that to me is unexcusable. I am just on a general principle, I am definitely against that. If it's a new tooling kit that has individual Lincoln Link tracks, that's already bad enough as is, but taking a tank that's made to be motorized and doing that to it, yeah, that's not gonna fly. So fortunately, there's a solution for this. And obviously, it's not gonna be using these. So in its place, I'm gonna be utilizing God's chosen material for tracks, which is single piece vinyl. These tracks here, I believe are Tamiya, if I'm not mistaken. Yep, they're definitely Tamiya from the flex of it, and are from, I believe, an M48A3 patent. This set of tracks here, I actually got from one of you viewers out there. We kind of bumped into each other on a patent Facebook group, got chatting for a little bit, and he had a spare set of tracks on hand. I said, hey, if you're not doing anything with them, you know, send them my way. And he did, along with a little piece of European chocolate, which again, bro, I, I cannot thank you enough. You know, I, I, I just thank you for, for the tracks. And, uh, you know, this build's actually dedicated to you because you're part of the reason why I'm actually taking it on. So these tracks here are from an M48. The individual in, in mind was replacing these tracks with a set of workable track links. So he does have a brain stem and I want to give him a shout out for that. And these tracks here date back to 1975, 1978 with the tooling. Not so much these tracks precisely because Tamiya still produces these kits, but the molds of these tracks are from that era. The tracks themselves are decently rendered. I always did like this pattern of track. The face detailing on them is good. It's way better than the freaking, than the Lincoln Link ones on the Academy, where they're basically flush as opposed to these ones here where they actually have depth and dimension to them. On the inside, they do have some nice texturing. The only ding found on these rubber tracks is that the guide tooth is off center, where it's literally on the center of the track link when it should be gapping or bridging the gap between the two links, which is something that these older tracks tend not to do. These crap individual Lincoln Link ones do, you know, they do have that correct. However, the tracks are still garbage and they're still not going to be used, regardless where the track tooth is. So these tracks are going to be utilized in place. However, I wanted to go a step further with this one. So not only am I going to give it the proper track, I'm also going to do the opposite end of what this kit was originally intended for. This kit was originally intended to be a static model with individual Lincoln Link tracks, and I'm going to go ahead and not only replace the tracks with a single piece of vinyl, I'm going to make this damn thing motorized. And that is something that's going to be relatively easily done, because again, the model was originally intended to be motorized by Tamiya back in 1970, and Academy themselves kept the avenue open for motorization. So if anyone has watched my videos before, you'll know that if I'm building an Academy or a Tamiya pattern patent-based vehicle, you bet your ass it's gonna have a gearbox in it because I'm gonna make the damn thing run. Otherwise, if, you know, if I'm going to build an M60A2 and have it static, I might as well just roll with some of the other kits on the market, like the option again from AFV Club and or the one from Dragon. I've already built the Dragon one, now the last one in the trifecta of the modern M68 2 kits is one from AAV Club. Will I get it? Well, we'll see how that you know cookie crumbles as time goes on. But for the time being, this bad boy here is getting motorized. And to do that, we need to go ahead and bounce to the actual shop. So here's the hull going through its production. From here, it's just pretty much copied and paste standard Tamiya or Academy M60 family. However, the Academy kit, specifically this generation of the Academy kit, is a little bit more polished in some regards compared to some of the other ones that came before it. And in some cases, it has features where it's... why? <laughs> what I'm specifically referring to are with the swing arms. Now, 
all the swing arms have been installed and also there's an extra bit of detailing added to all the swing arms that is different from the older generation kits. If we look at the center portion here of the swing arm, you're going to see the swing arm itself with a little fastener mounted on the inside. This is present on all of the Tamiya and Academy kits since really when the kits originally came out in the 70s. However, on this version over here, they made a slight modification where they bored out the center detailing over here and they molded that as a separate component and you just simply glue it on in place. Here on the runner, we can see the new addition of these extra little hubcaps that are right over here. And you simply snip them off and you glue them into these center wells once it's installed, giving you the complete look that we have here. Um, I literally have only one thing to say about this addition and that's why? I mean, seriously, it literally does absolutely nothing. Um, the original pieces that had these molded in looked perfectly fine, I always felt. And honestly, even with the piece being molded separately, it doesn't really bring all that much to the table. If anything, when it's done, it looks almost identical in outer appearance compared to the way it was before. So I literally cannot explain why th this was deemed to be a good idea, but regardless, it does install very easily, mostly effortlessly, but it does add a little bit more complexity to the model compared to the legacy versions, where obviously now you have a small little piece over here that needs to be clipped away, cleaned, and then carefully glued in place with just the right amount of glue, If otherwise, and you can screw up basically anywhere in between. You snip the piece off too much, flings off the lost part yet, it's gone. You don't clean the piece properly, it's not going to fit in right. You clean the piece off too much, it's now going to look bad. And if you put too much glue, it's not going to sit right, and it's also going to look bad. So it just adds more complexity to the build, albeit it's far from being you know something that's impossible to put together, but it is something to, to keep in mind for anyone who's working on one of these. Also, one Plus, though, is that Academy themselves must have realized that these things probably are a pain in the ass to clean and install, so they do give you an ample amount of spares. I don't believe I lost any during the construction over here, and as you can see, I only have one more to go, and I have about two extra spares that are present on the runner. I think there was another one that was over here, probably popped off somewhere in the box during, you know, when I was fiddling with the runners, but regardless, I do have more than enough for the job at hand. Outside of that, the remainder of the lower hull is pretty much identical to what you've seen on past Tamiya pattern or Academy pattern M60 builds that I've posted previously. And that means I went ahead and built them in a similar way. With the way the M60 hull is designed, you do have those two halves that need to be glued together, which means you are going to have a center seam to contend with. As I've mentioned on a number of these pattern family builds, I like to thoroughly case the bottom hull here with some cast texturing in order to blend in all of the seam work so it's nice and seamless but also gives you a little bit more extra realism and accuracy because of course the real vehicles are an entire cast bathtub type assembly on the center portion over here i sand this pre pretty smooth as this is something that i've seen referenced on a few other vehicles out there and also that little axis hatch here has been thoroughly blended away one thing that is interesting is the rear plate you can see how academy adapted their kit in order to adapted for the M60A2, where we have an, a complete replacement rear section over here, and the original one that's applied with the model is simply omitted from this build. This one here just drops directly on in place, and there's really nothing to mention outside of that, but there is, of course, a small little bit of seam that needs to be flared in, which obviously you can see I took care of that with the bodywork. The face portion does have some adequate bodywork, or I should say cast texturing present on the molded surface, so it's something that once it's blended in it's going to look pretty well once the paint goes on outside of that the other details again standard tamiya pattern m60 family kit from the 70s where we have the shock absorbers that go to nowhere on the real vehicle these would of course be connected to sections on the swing arms obviously those are not present on the older swing arm yet they went ahead and molded this tub for some reason uh, again i'm just a little confused on why they thought that was a great idea um the little hooks that get glued to the sides go on without any problems uh, anything else to mention uh, oh one other thing uh, the swing arms themselves th one thing I always notice on these patterns of kits is that the stem is slightly too long and if you just try to install it raw like that it's not gonna fit in very well and you're gonna have a gap an uneven gap on the swing arms where they make contact with the swing arm housings and so on these models over here it's a real simple fix it's what it Bean cut snip you remove about a millimeter or so off of each of the stem ends and with that little bit of material removed it always makes the swing arms install on in a more easily 
done way. When you're installing the swing arms, you want to make sure that the axles line up, or line up as good as they can possibly be. This one here generally sticks down slightly a little bit lower compared to the ones in the middle, but that's normal for this pattern of kit. Same thing with the one on the reverse side. For this model here, it's definitely going to be relevant, obviously, because it is going to be converted to be motorized, and, you know, it's just going to aid for a better performance if that's the case. But other than that, not really much to talk about there. Uh, obviously, the final drives have been secured on at this point. Normally, I would, you would glue the little lock or the, the, the slot filler that has the stem in it. Obviously, for this, it's not going to be necessary because motorized, or at least that's the idea. One thing that I really do like, and it's going to make the motorization conversion go by much easier, is that even though this was designed to be static from the get-go, they went ahead and molded in that little tang here that's found on the rear portion of the grill work so that the upper hull can lock into place with the motorization locks that was originally designed on the upper hull back in the 70s. So that's really good and it's going to make my job a bit easier because I don't have to worry about engineering some kind of a fastening system. So that's definitely a plus side for this kit here. There are a few other details to mention, but these are going to be fitted to the vehicle as it goes on, such as the front toe points and the rear toe points. And the front toe points are originally molded into this runner right over here. These are the original designed ones that Tamiya did in 1970. However, Academy themselves went ahead and made an update set for these exact parts and are found on another sprue. And those ones are a little bit more polished and just a little bit more representative of the real M60, where they had that little hole that's drilled in. I believe they also changed slightly the geometry a little bit. Regardless, Regardless, that is actually a really good change up that Academy made to the old school tooling and it's just interesting to see some of the older remembrance found on these runner here's like these and also the ones I touched upon before with the motorization exclusive sprockets which are not going to be used on this build and you'll be seeing why even though I am going to be making this model motorized momentarily. Mount on the upper hull, continue with the external fittings until the model's ready for painting. And although that's something I can do, but for this build here, no, 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 no. This is where I'm going to shift things up and I'm going to tap into this kit's original 1970s Tamiya DNA and I'm going to go ahead and convert it to be motorized. And here you can see the motorization conversion in progress. So the first thing that I need to touch upon is the gearbox. Here we have the Tamiya dual motor gearbox. I touched upon it before. And I've also mentioned this in a number of other videos for the same reason. And these units are awesome. They go together really, really quickly. At this point, I've done so many, I could basically build them blindfolded. And they are really durable. Good design overall. I love these things. The gearbox itself is relatively left stock. The only tweaks that I need to do is making sure it can fit better into the engine bay area over here. And that's going to be modifying several aspects of the outer sections where you remove some material in order to slim it down a little bit in order to get it again to fit better. Same is also true here for the front section. There's just a little bit of plastic that protrudes out from this area over here. It's not necessary, gets in the way. So just a few little moments with the high speed removal bit on the Dremel and the piece is all polished down and ready to go. Generally, the next step would be to try to mount this inside of the hull. And in the past, I've developed a number of different solutions to do that, where generally there's a column of resin that emerges from this section over here, fits in place, I put a bolt in the bottom, much along the lines as the way the models would have had originally. However, for this one, although I could have easily have done that, I wanted to try something else. The fastener does work, however, I want to see if I can mount this gearbox in in as low of a profile as possible, where it adds absolutely no other holes or other type of equipment found on the bottom portion of the lower hull. And to do that, I was you know, looking at the design of or what the kit gives me, looking at the gearbox, thinking back and forth, and I think I came up with an interesting solution. What I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be repurposing the original gearbox rails that are integrally molded into the lower hull. And the way this works is I have a thick piece of styrene over here. I cut it to fit inside of those rails. And the gearbox simply just going to connect to it. I'm going to super glue this in place. So it's going to be a permanent installation. It, I'm, I should be able to have everything lined up appropriately. Worst comes to worst, I could just rip everything out and try it again, but if I play my cards right, I don't think that's going to be necessary. On the gearbox on the bottom portion, I glued on this piece of styrene. It's a lot thinner compared to the other piece, and this is just used as a spacer to make sure that the gearbox is at the proper alignment. When it comes time for fitting on the gearbox, the key is to have the piece as square and centered as possible. And this is true for all these gearbox installations. Fortunately, on the M60 hull over here, this is relatively easily done because we have a very nice visual cue, and that is the center line here of the exhaust grills found on the back. And on the 
two, it's even easier because we have this nice little slit line right here found on this lower portion of the hatch door. And again, gives a perfect visual cue on the center line. With a pencil, I went ahead and sketched in this section over here. And on the gearbox, this center rib here is going to be basically my rear sight. So I'm gonna line everything up appropriately when the time comes. Push it as flush against the end here as possible because you wanna have the proper tension. And by the way, with the way everything works out, the axle here is in the exact same location as the static axle plug that is kit supplied. So again, it's really convenient on the way everything works out on these M60s. With the rib over here, I'm gonna be able to visually align the line I drew with the pencil as long as well as I should say the other line found on the rear hatch over here. So it's going to line up absolutely nice and true. Once the piece is ready to go and is glued in place, I am going to add several other types of glue around the section over here in order to give it some more robustness and some more strength. But I'll touch upon that momentarily. Once the gearbox is in place, then I'll start with the soldering connections as well as also the electrical for the battery as well as the three-way switch. Again, I'll be circling up with that momentarily. And a few moments later, I went ahead and added the glues to the appropriate locations. I'm lining everything up so it's nice and square. And at this point here, I'm just going to set aside and let the glues dry. But as you can see so far, the theory is working out pretty well. The gearbox is in, the axles are in the right place, and most importantly, the bottom portion up here has absolutely no other added appendages required in order to secure everything in place. So overall, it looks like probably be recycling this system more frequently on future M60 or just patent-based vehicle builds. While the glues are also still setting, I'm now going to go ahead and make sure that the upper hulls fit. And generally, there are some modifications and clearances I need to make on the inner side portion because of the motors and how they fit. So as you can see, like I just mentioned, there is a little bit of resistance back here on the back, and it's preventing the front from securing in place in a nice tight manner. The problem is with this little chunk of plastic right over here, and it's making contact with this portion here of the gearbox. Not the gearbox itself, but the little plastic sections here of the motors. So with the high speed removal bit, I'm just gonna carefully remove and delete some of the plastic in this area. With the way the model is molded, there is a sufficient amount of plastic thickness in this area over here, so you could lose a little bit of it and still retain structural integrity. So here's the inside with the material removed. Again, you have to be really careful because even though there is sufficient material in there to remove, you have to be still careful to make sure you don't poke out through the detailing. If that happens, uh, you're, you're pretty much screwed. But if you take your time and you remove just a little bit of material every single pass, you should make out pretty well. So anyway, here's the piece over here. I also, by the way, tried to experiment by removing a little bit of nylon here on the motors. It doesn't really matter uh, from just dry fitting, but regardless, you know, I just gave it a shot. You know, anyway. So on the bottom here, I added the poly cap, which is what you need to secure in place. So let's go ahead and secure this. One thing I like is how long the tongue is over here on the grower here this is great because the longer the tongue the more secure the piece is they could have easily have given you like a quarter of that because it's not really important you know as a static model but hey that's that's one positive design feature that it, the kit does have okay so you line up the tongue first and then it just goes in place with the poly cap and as you can see the fit absolutely seamless and again, this is just one of the benefits of motorized converting a M60 pattern of vehicle. As I touched upon before, of all of the models out there that are best converted to functional, the Tamiya and or Academy pattern of M60 A1, it's always the best in my opinion. It just lends itself for this type of a procedure. So now that that works, right now, by the way, you'll see that I spray painted the front section with a little bit of olive drab. This is because the hatch is functional and before the hatch gets installed in place, I paint the underside of the hatch and also the hatch well area over here just to you know make sure that once the hatch is functional, you don't have any missed areas and exposed plastic shining through. Just a quick little tip. With the gearbox mounted into the hull, the last real important conversion that needs to be done 
are with the assembly of the sprockets. Obviously, you're not going to be able to go anywhere with your tank if the sprockets are not functional. So here we have the sprockets here on the table. This sprocket here has already been fully assembled and the revisions have been made. And this one here is going through the revision process. So as I touched upon before, one change that Academy made to this kit, which differentiates it from the other M60s that I've seen in the past, is with the design of the sprockets. In the past, these sprockets were your standard Tamiya spec sprockets, the ones that have that really cool hex pattern in the back, and then they plug in place via uh, polycap, and you know, you could either leave it static, or the hex plugs into a gearbox and you could run it. Well, with this one here, they completely redesigned it by retooling the sprocket sections that have the hex absent. Again, I basically am rethreading material that I mentioned earlier. So in order to get this one operational, I'm gonna have to make a modification to the sprocket itself. Well, this is where I came up with the following solution. In, as we can recall, I'm using the Tamiya gearbox, which I have right over here. And the Tamiya gearbox has this little hex shaft here, and this is what something grips you in order to rotate. So what I went ahead and did was I came up with a solution to adapt this sprocket to fit onto that axle. And that's what we have right here on this sprue. This here is a new 3D printed component that I developed just for this type of an application. Not necessarily for this kit here, but it can be used on a number of other motorized converted models with the Tamiya gearbox. Basically what this does is that this is going to replace the rubber poly cap that gets secured into the center portion here of the sprocket. You replace that with this new 3D printed insert. This gets glued to the sprocket and then you'll see that this piece has the little miniature hex section integrally printed on. This will insert into the shaft once the sprocket's fully assembled. Now adapting the stock sprocket to work on this gearbox shaft. Right now these are a pre-production sample and on the production units I'm going to make some alterations to them because currently they are a little bit on the longer side. I was measuring the wrong poly cap when I came up with this set. So once the pieces fit in place, you can see how much it sticks up. And this is something that I'm going to be taking care of on this example. However, the ones that are going to be listed on the EastCoastArmory.com Shapeway store are going to be the proper height. So that's something I want to mention. Why this would be important? Well, keep in mind, I do have another set on the ECA catalog, which is the hex adapter. And that's used for those other Tamiya ones that have the hex section. This one here is going to be really designed for other kits out there that are not necessarily motorized, but you can actually do the conversion yourself just like I'm doing here. I think I'm also going to amend the other set where I have a version that has both these cylinders and also the hexes themselves because I figured that with the use of both of them, this will really give you a lot more meat to grab onto the spindle over here. It will actually give you a stronger, sturdier mounting as opposed to the single unit that I already touched upon earlier. Obviously, those systems do work. And by the way, I'm surprised I've actually sold a number of those. So, uh... Thank you for those people who are watching these videos and are getting the same idea. But uh, this one here is going to be another alteration or an enhancement to that following set. The new ones, again, are listed on the EastCoastArmory.com Shapeway store, and they're posted with the other ECA 135th scale and 148th scale components. These pieces here, of course, are 3D printed, but unlike some of the detail parts, they're not HD 3D printed. They're just your standard white nylon because they are stronger and better suited for the role that I have as opposed to the other medium. And here's the insert that has been shortened to length. The next thing to do is another bit of detailing that I frequently reference in these patent family vehicle builds, and that involves the sprocket, namely the mud slits. Oops, come back over here. <laughs> namely the mud slits. So here we have the stock sprocket. Note the mud slits are absent, which again is a very common thing found on just about all of these patent family kits that are on the market, both new and old, which is funny because as much as they redesigned the kit, they still went ahead and admitted those parts. And here you can see what the sprocket looks like, fully assembled with those mud slits added. As you can see, they really do add a lot to the model's detailing overall. Fortunately, adding the mud slits is fairly easily done. It does require a little bit of technique, but once you've mastered it, it's something that you can do with your eyes closed. The other, again, thing that I always reference in these videos is that you do not necessarily have to have the mud slits. There are examples of M60 and M48 pattern sprockets that do not have the mud slits present from 
uh, several other of the subcontractors that were producing these castings. So it's not necessarily inaccurate to have them without the mud slits present, and you can just build it out of the box and be technically, you know, perfectly fine. But if you really do want to add that little extra push and detail edge to your model, adding the mud slits is always a very easy thing to do. And once done, it definitely helps the look of the build. So to add the mud slits on this, the first thing you need to do is to mark the locations here on the sprocket where the center portions, or, or I should say the horizontal lines of the mud slits are going to go. And this is best done on the lathe. The reason why you need the lathe for this is because it's going to make a nice even line in the two locations where the lines are going to be present. Now, if you do not have a lathe, as many people don't, you can still do the exact same procedure, but you could do this with a drill. A standard electric hand drill will do the job just fine. Basically, you can do that old uh, Boy Scout trick where you take the piece, you put it in the chuck of the drill, you put the drill in a vise, you turn the drill on, locking it in the permanently on position, and now you have yourselves a nice little uh, makeshift lathe. From there, you can add the two little lines to their appropriate locations. However, since I do have a lathe, I'm just going to go ahead and utilize that. And here you can see the lines added in place. As you can see, it does a fantastic job with marking the units as I just touched upon. So once the lines are added, the, oh, the one other thing I want to mention is with the actual position of the second bottom line. You want to pay attention to where the bottom portion here of the hub is because if you add the line too low when you drill it out you're going to be off center and you're actually going to chew up the fasteners found on the inside there and you're not doing yourselves any favors so want to carefully mark exactly where the bottom portion is and adjust accordingly so once you have that factored out the next thing to do is to add the three lines so the first one i'm going to do is add one right here dead center the mud slits on the m60 and the pattern are in a triangular type format so it's fairly easily cobbled together by just basically using your eye and making sure that the parts are by and large where they need to be. What I like to use, I actually like to use the teeth themselves of the sprocket as a gauge, and this is an easy way to help with the adjustment process. So I already have the first one marked, and now I'm just going to go ahead and put one on this side. One, two, three, four, and one on this side. And once the pieces are marked, you can see exactly where they need to go. Okay, so the next thing to do is to actually drill them out. And to do that, I'm gonna utilize my Dremel here with a small router bit. Here goes the bit that I use. In fact, I have the box right here. And these are the router bits that I use along with the vendor that I purchased them from. The link, of course, is found in the video description listed below. The router bits here are perfect for this application because they are the exact size required to drill out the hole. So once the hole is drilled out, no other further refinement needs to be done with a needle file or any other type of tool in order to complete the look. So the Dremel is going to be used to drill two holes, one on the top, one on the bottom, and then the material in the middle just simply just gets deleted and eaten away once the two holes are drilled out and you just have to be very careful and have a steady hand for this procedure and if you can manage that you'll be able to get the setup to the way you see it here and after some real short work of the dremel the holes have been drilled out and now it's ready for assembly to assemble the part you really want to super glue the insert into the well in a very thorough manner. Keep in mind, the glue is going to be the thing that locks everything in place and will keep the sprocket from rotating. So you want to use a decent amount of glue. You want to just place it on the exterior portion here of the stem. And really get this guy seated in place. Okay, I am going to add a little bit more glue, but this one is going to be done with the fine liquid thin CA right over here because I want to add it to the edges where it's just going to seep right in and solidify in that format. You obviously don't want to have the glue in the center portion over there. It's going to kind of negate the, the whole 
purpose of these pieces, but once the thin stuff gets in and locks in place, it's really gonna make for a rock solid mounting. To help me get the super glue in there, I'm just gonna use the wire trick where you take a thin piece of wire. If anyone has ever seen one of those James Bond movies where I think some ninjas poison someone in James Bond's bed, it's done basically in the same way. To where it needs to go, just like that. The glue is so runny that'll easily flow in between the gaps down the center portion, and once it solidifies, this thing's going to be solid as a rock. So at that point there, I can cap this super glue. Don't need this anymore. And I can commence with the remainder of the assembly. And at this point here, it's just typical for the Academy kit. So the sprocket tooth aligners just get dropped into place. Just gonna have a small little drop of super glue right here. One other quick reminder for anyone who's building an M60 or a Patton, when you're doing the retainer, you want to have the conical curve section on the inside and the flat section on the outside. This is something that can easily be mistaken during your build, and it's one thing to avoid. And if you're working on an M60 or a Patton for the first time, this is something that can potentially happen to you, so definitely bear that in mind. Alright, then this piece here just gets glued into place. Find that little sweet spot and boom, it just drops right in. Okay, so this is also super important. You see, you have some tolerances here on how the sprocket can go. This is something you have to address right away because if this thing sets cockeyed, the track isn't gonna fit on right and you're gonna be literally dead in the water. So to adjust it, what you do is you take a length of track and you basically wrap it around the sprocket like so and the track will act as a jig and basically align the teeth to their center portions, keeping everything in spec and in line with each other. Obviously this is easily done with single piece vinyl as opposed to length and length. However, for the lulls, let me go ahead and grab that cancerous track that we have right here. And once the sprocket is assembled, you can literally just line it up and run it up and down these sections like you see here. This will ensure that the timing is properly set. And when it comes to sprockets, timing is a big part of the assembly. As the build continues, one other thing I want to mention involves the air filter box. This is an iconic bit of detailing found on the M48 and M60 pattern vehicles. And the kit ones are decent, you know, they're fairly detailed for what they are. Uh, the one thing though that was omitted on this is a common thing seen on the Tamiya and the Academy pattern of patents and that involves the air intakes that are found right here on the opposite end. This is the piece here, it's a single molding, again decently rendered, however with the way it's rendered the intakes are molded solid. To fix this and to enhance the detailing with a pin vise here with a small drill bit, hopefully it comes out on screen, I'm able to take this bit and drill out the center portions here of these inlets. Don't want to go too far obviously you don't want to drill all the way through just a nice little indentation is all you need just like so you do that to both sides and this is the type of detailing you'll end up with it's one of those quick little bit of improvements to add to your patent based vehicles that always makes them look good in the end with the gearbox fitted in place and with the sprocket squared away the last important bit of functional modification that needs to be made to this model is with the remainder of the circuitry. Now obviously because this model is just simple motorization and it's not radio controlled, this is going to cut down on the complexity immensely, but that doesn't mean that some creativity still needs to be exhibited in order to conceal the power switch and also exactly how to hook everything up on the inside of the model, which we'll be going over in a second. So on the table here we have all of the tank's electronic systems broken down into a bench test type format. Here you can see the motors, these have been plucked out of the gearbox momentarily in order to do the electrical hookups. Here we have the power source, which for this model here, and it's also true for basically all of my other 135 motorized converted builds, I'm using dual AA batteries. And here we have the on and off switch, which is a three-way position switch. And you'll see why that's relevant momentarily. So there's nothing really much to talk about with the batteries, although that when you're hooking them up, since they are going to be powered by a single battery source, they 
do need to have the appropriate terminals line up with each other otherwise you'll have one motor going one direction and the other going the opposite direction and this is obviously problematic unless you just want to have your tank do a neutral steer all the time all day every day so if you carefully mark which polarity is which this is a great way to prevent that sort of problem from happening outside of that the two motors are just hooked up as the way you see here so when the electricity turns on both motors are going to be moving in the exact same direction for the power source again i'm using two double a batteries and the battery box itself is this unit that i've used on a number of these motorized converted builds this system is really really convenient they're really low profile and super simplistic which is great because when you need to stuff this system into the tank's hull it's low profile it can easily slide in and i can easily remove it through the confines of the turret hole without having to take the model apart again a very very beneficial feature indeed the unit is plugged into a 9 volt jack which also increases its simplicity and potentially opens up the potential of swapping these out with a single 9 volt but generally in the past that wasn't really necessary on my other builds as for the three-way switch this is something that I incorporated on this build and many of my other recent motorized converteds is because with this system you can have the ability to have the model move in both forward and reverse with the way the switch is wired up, the middle is off, you move the toggle one way, the motors will propel, and if you go the other way, it'll go in the opposite direction. As for what direction they are at this moment, I, I don't really know, I just finished wiring it up, and I'll see momentarily once I actually patch everything together, but this will be marked towards the tail end of the build. As for wiring up a three-way switch to go in reverse, there are lots of excellent resources out there on the internet, but my go-to is found in the video description listed below. I'll also see if I could throw it right here up on the screen so everyone can see. So this is the, the chart, and again, the link is found in the video description. This has always been instrumental with wiring up one of these type of systems, and it's really easy to do and can be done relatively easily. As for the switch's location... I'm going to leave that in. As for the switch's location, the switch for this one, I'm moving into the turret. Now, in the past, on some builds, I've had them in the hull. And other builds, lately, I've been moving them into the turret because this cuts down on the amount of access holes that need to be uh, punched into the lower hull. At, like I mentioned earlier on this one, I really don't want to drill any more holes into the lower hull than I need to. So, for this one, I came up with some other solutions for the gearbox mounting. And the switch is also... In that same category on the front portion here i thought about potentially hiding the switch underneath the loader or i should say the driver's hatch because it's you know a real easily accessible location it's in the hull set so streamlines a little bit of the electronic work however with the battery that's going to be housed into the hull over here it kind of gobbles up basically all the free room that i have so mounting a switch here is a bit problematic so rather than mounting the switch in that location i went ahead and secured it into the turret now to do this obviously you need to add a bit more complexity to the wiring in order to execute this and execute in a way which makes everything removable so you can see here that i have these two small little quick connect plugs right over here and they have their corresponding ones found on both of the hull mounted bits of equipment this again is absolutely paramount because this allows me to take the turret on and off completely without there being any sort of permanent appendage hanging either be it the motors or the battery itself. I can thoroughly disconnect everything without there being a whole lot of dangly stuff fitted to the turret or even the hull for that matter. On the plugs themselves, these again I picked up I believe off of Amazon if I'm not mistaken if not I can find the link to the location where I purchased and that will be found in the video description listed below these units are great they're really handy I like them because they're low profile and they really don't take up a lot of space which obviously on a 135th scale is something of a luxury so with the switch moved into the turret area over here you obviously need a point of entry and on the m60a2 starship we have the commander's cupola i was potentially thinking about mounting it either in one of these two turret hatches however i found that the cupola was the best and easiest option to do this mounting in and also to actually have the hatch fully functional so here we have the cupola it's partially assembled at this time 
This just drops directly into place and it conceals the switch completely. But one quick modification that I made was with the hatch itself. The hatch is designed to be static on the tank, so you either glue it in the open or closed state. For this model over here, I went ahead and made a quick little modification with a pin vise where I drilled out the center hinge section and now the unit is fully functional, as you can see. Obviously, there goes your entry point into the model and that's why you'll notice that the, the switch is located all the way to the three quarter area here of the cupola mount so that it lines up perfectly with the cupola hatch when the cupola is at amidships. Obviously, the pin here is going to be shortened. This is just there just to temporarily hold it in place, but just a small little sewing pin here is going to be the new hinge mechanism for the loader's hatch, or I should say the commander's cupola hatch. This was drilled out with a pin vise with a really small bit that I have right over here, again, from the same vendor as I touched upon before. Hopefully, it comes out into focus. And just with a nice steady hand, I was able to carefully drill everything out. So... With this all taken care of, let me go ahead and temporarily take that off, I could go ahead and plug everything together. One other thing to mention about the plugs is that you'll notice that I have a different corresponding plug for each of the systems. The battery plug is different from the motor plug, and this was done by design to prevent any crisscrossing that could potentially happen if you take everything apart. If you go with this type of a setup, this will eliminate any sort of problems on crisscrossing the units when remounting them to the model. So these ones just simply plug in where they need to go. And we'll see this thing fire up. Okay, so right now the switch is in the center, so it's off. Move it one way. And then when I move it the other way, they're moving in the opposite direction. And note the motors are moving in unison, which is exactly what you want. The very last thing I want to mention in terms of the electrical system is the use of the electric grease. This is something that I've been modifying my older builds with and also I've been adding to all of my newer builds because of the potential of the switch to corrode when the model is in storage in its display case for a long period of time. This is something that I've noticed happen on a few of my other older motorized converter builds. Even though the battery is disconnected, for some reason or another, these cheapo switches over here seem to corrode on the inside contacts. And obviously this is something that's less than ideal. I have, by the way, got all of my corroded switches to work again, just a little bit of alcohol into the contact area. And after a few moments of fiddling with the toggle left and right, was able to take off the corrosion and the models were able to operate again. However, from what I read on the internet, a few little drops of this onto the contact area, it's a great way to prevent that from happening in the first place. So right now, the switch has already been modified with the grease and that's been added to the internal contacts. That's why the switch itself has a little bit of sheen to it. And I am going to add another little glob right here on the contacts themselves that are exposed. So just a little bit of grease covering these areas should prevent any sort of oxidation that may occur when the model is in its long-term storage in the display cabinet. Since I don't really get access to this area here of the model, the lump of grease in there shouldn't cause any problems. And here's the model partially assembled, and at this point here, it's actually ready to head off into paint. Before I do though, there are a couple of quirks I want to mention at this time, as opposed to later on when the model is fully completed. So the build itself goes together fairly well, however, there were some quirks and some errors that I did notice with the instruction manual. So the first quirk I'm going to point out is with the tow cables themselves. So the tow cables at this point have been fitted to the model. Now this is something that's generally different compared to my normal builds where the tow cables as well as just Pioneer tools are added at the very tail end after everything is painted and weathered. For this one here though I went with this route because of the small little clips that are fabricated that are on the sides. Of course just like with all of the M60 and patent based tank series there are lots of clips that are found on the side portion of the turret and this helps align the cable when fitted in place. These details are absent on the stock Academy kit. So the ones that you see here are scratch built. These are scratch built out of thin strips of thin 
soda can aluminum that were cut and then bent to shape and added to the appropriate locations. Fortunately, finding reference materials for the Starship's dirt is very easily done, and just with a quick Google search, I was able to figure out where the corresponding locations go. Same is also true for the one on the opposite side. As for the tow cable assembly themselves, they are done with the Tamiya pattern where we have a length of nylon string and then two end connectors that get glued to either end. This is a very simple system and it's one that works very well on many other kits with a similar pattern. One thing about the strings that it does have to be snipped to the appropriate length by the builder and this is something that is again typically seen on models and the academy kit here does a decent job with the instructions here you can see the length written in both millimeters but for those who are metrically challenged <laughs> we have a scale length of the string right over here so you basically just take the string you mark it with a pencil and you're good to go like i typically mentioned these are most of the time painted off the model and then secured at the tail end. However, for this one here, I believe I could go ahead and work around the detailing with a very fine paintbrush, but this is something that remains to be seen. Generally, I'm not really comfortable with doing that, but, you know, we'll see how I'll be able to pull this off. I do have a bunch of fresh paintbrushes on hand that are nice and precise, so adding the paint to the appropriate locations should not be too much of an issue. The other thing I want to mention involves the lack of a certain piece of detailing. That's what we have right over here. For one reason that completely escapes me, the model does not contain the antenna base. And on the M68 II, you would have two antenna bases. One is actually right over here. And this is the type where you just have a thin little piece of rubber emerging from the center portion. That's what the antenna would connect to. And then the other would be a standard post-World War II pattern of spring antenna base. And that would be housed right here, or secured right here to this very interesting antenna base well. The kit has the inset here for the antenna base, but for some reason, it's just not supplied. I don't see how that could have possibly happened. It must have been an oversight by the guys who were creating this kit here, but it's definitely something that's a bit interesting. And it's also uh, kind of funny because the Dragon Kit contains this little bit of equipment, and then some people will claim that this one here is more accurately detailed than the Dragon one. So, uh, yeah, I think we could go ahead and chalk that comment up to being rubbish but regardless the antenna well itself is also interesting to point out because it is to spec with the antenna base that were originally supplied with the Tamiya or in this case the Academy pattern of M60A1 kits. The omission of this detailing here to me is a bit perplexing specifically since to my eye, it looks like this was something that was on the designer's to-do list, and for one reason or another, they forgot to add it to one of the runners, or they thought that this piece was found on one of the other runners that were supplied with the other original m 60 a one parts. But the omission of this detail here is actually one that does hurt the look of the build quite a bit, because all of these m 60 a 2 starships would have had the antenna base located in that section over there. So, so much so that if you are working on one of these Academy M60A2s, I cannot recommend enough the addition of some kind of an aftermarket antenna-based solution for that section over there. Fortunately, there are several options out there for antenna bases which would be suitable for this pattern of vehicle. One notable example is from the company Adler's Nest. That was an excellent set. I'm not sure if they're still in production or if they're really that available anymore. However, the set contained a base that was made from injection molded plastic, but what was really cool was the spring section was made from an actual metal spring that was formed to the correct shape, and it even had a small micro CNC brass top section where the wire would plug into. It was very, very impressive. However, I'm not going to be using one of those sets on this model because I don't have any left on stock, but instead, luckily, I have a bit of equipment that I use for a situation like this. A number of builds ago, I went ahead and made a mold of the Tamiya M60A1 antenna base. This is literally the exact same component which would have been, I think, intended for this model here, so much so that you'll see it plugs directly into the recess that is found right there on the back. It's probably gonna go on a lot easier once it's glued in place, but as you can see, the piece is a perfect addition and is actually a quite relevant addition to add to this model right here. The section is made from cast resin, and this is the type of thing that I made a mold of all those builds ago because, you know, I do build a lot of American vehicles, specifically post-war American vehicles, and it's nice to have an antenna base mold on hand for a situation just like this. 
The piece is drilled out with a pin vise, and of course, once the model is fully built, painted, and weathered, the remainder of the antenna will be mounted in place. But again, this is one of those little bits of detailing that is absent on the Academy kit, and it's definitely something that can hurt the look of the build if not addressed. Another bit of detailing that is absent on all of the Academy, and to me, a pattern of M60s, is with the front brush guard supports that we have right here and here. These are something that are not present on any of these kits. And again, this is just a carryover from the kit's original tooling from 1970. Here you can see, like I always mention on my M60 builds, I fabricate the bit of detailing out of a small length of plastruct angle. I simply cut it to shape and glued it to these two sections over here. It's also important to note that on the Dragon kit, these are integrally supplied and are better detailed because they have their little fastener details as well as mounting boss details present. So again, yes, the Dragon kit is better in detailing compared to the Academy one. One other interesting quirk to point out is something that is actually supplied with the kit, but it's not mentioned in the instructions. And this is something that I found to be quite interesting and involves the commander's cupola that we have right over here. To get an idea on what I'm referring to, here you can see the instructions for the assembly of the mini turret. And as you can see, it looks like it's a pretty straightforward assembly. However, looks are definitely deceiving because there are several bits of details that are supplied with the kit that are absent on the instructions. And it's something that if you're not paying attention, you can easily make the mistake on your own build. So the first thing I'm gonna point out is actually a pretty big one. Right here, there's actually a chute that deflects the spent casings that are emitted from the MG when in operation. You can see it over here on this illustration, but it's absent on this one. However, the mount is still there. This is the chute in question. Obviously, it's a pretty substantial bit of material, which is fortunate because you're going to notice it missing when you're building your model. And the piece itself is just simply glued on in place. Fortunately, the piece just goes on absolutely perfectly. There's no hand fitting or any other that type of stuff to mention. So you just need to snip it off the sprue, clean it up, and then glue it in place. However, it's just not mentioned in the instructions, so this is something to pay attention to. The next omission in the instructions involves the brush guard that we have right here, as well as the internal periscope. The internal periscope is mentioned, as is the outer casing. However, what is not mentioned is with the guard, or I should say the little visor section. This is, again, kit supplied. And what's cool about this kit, and it's kind of sad that's not in the instructions, as the piece is actually made to function. You can see it's in the closed state right here but I could flip it up revealing the internal detailing right there. This is something I actually really like. This is a nice bit of engineering and bravo to Academy for incorporating it. However, they went a little too ahead of themselves and they forgot to mention that in the instruction sheet. And with the way the piece is assembled, this is the type of thing that cannot be mounted retroactively. You have to mount it on before the piece gets installed because that's how the piece is sandwiched together and how the piece is able to function. So when you're going through your build, pay attention to this because if you miss this, you're gonna be pretty much kneecapping yourself. And that's really all there is to mention on the cupola, which outside of those two hiccups, the cupola is actually a very nice bit of equipment. And again, I really like the way Academy did the rendering on it. The one thing that may or may not be a bit of a ding is with the inner portion over here. Obviously this would be a hollow chute because this is where the spent shells would come out. However, on this build here, I'm just gonna leave it like this because you know it's on the underside and it's not really that visible. But uh, you know, to be fair, the dragon one has that part cut out. So <laughs> that is something I do wanna mention. The next bit of equipment I wanna mention involves the Xenon Searchlight. The Xenon Searchlight on this kit here is quite average to what you would expect on these plastic models, which means it actually is a little bit trickier to assemble than one might think. With the way the pieces assemble, it is a multi-part assembly and because that you will have lots of little seams to contend with, which is quite normal. However, with these Xenon Searchlights, it's always a pain in the ass because you have these integral grab handles here on the sides and trying to get in there with the sandpaper to buff away the seams is always very problematic. I was able to pull it off on this one here, but don't be surprised if you have to snip off the little grab handles just so you get a clean area to polish everything away. One advantage that this set has over the Dragon one, I will say, is with these small little details here. There are these small little mounting caps that have rivets on them or bolts on them, I should say. And these ones here are a separate component that are actually made out of photo etch, which again, it's a very nice touch. On the Dragon one, they're integrally molded in plastic. And the problem is when you're buffing away the seam, this is something that would be collateral damage. And it's almost impossible to f fully remove that seam and keep those details in place. So that is something that arguably this one does have the advantage over. But again, it's quite it's basically a wash at the end of the day because of the way the piece is assembled. The other thing I want to mention is that the 
the glass section that's found on the outer lens over here. This is something that I actually prefer the Dragon one over the the Academy one, because with the Academy one, you actually just have a clear piece of plastic that's applied with the model, and you actually have to manually trim it to fit inside over here. They tell you how to do it right here in the instruction manual. However, it's one of those things where if you've ever done them on other builds, it's a bit problematic. On the old Tamiya kit from 1970, oddly enough, they actually had this as a stamped out clear plastic piece, and arguably it was easier to install compared to something like we have here. The component on the Dragon, in comparison, the entire front part was made out of clear plastic, which made it easier to paint, in my opinion, because you just simply go in there with a paintbrush and you carefully paint the areas that aren't or wouldn't be clear. So this is something that shows a little bit more of um, its age. This is something that you generally see on older type kits compared to newer ones, but this is something I do want to mention. Obviously, as the build commences and goes further, you'll see what this piece looks like fully flushed out and fully assembled. But I did want to mention that at this time. The next thing I want to mention involves this little part that we have here. First, this sprue is the sprue specifically for the M60A2 Starship, so you will use basically everything on this sprue here, with the exception of one of the barrels, because again, you do have an option on which barrel you want, so no matter which barrel you pick, you're going to have one left as odd man out. The other thing, though, is with this box. This box here, for anyone who knows M60s, they'll quickly tell me, well, John, that's that rear box that's found on the rear section of the tinwork. And yes, you're absolutely correct. However, you'll see that the kit does supply you with one. And by the way, this component, I believe, is also found on this sprue, interestingly enough. If I was to take a guess, I believe that this one here might be an earlier pattern of this box, and this one here is the later pattern, but I'm just going by assumptions here. If anyone does know the true purpose of this pattern, feel free to put that in the comment section listed below. However, when you're following the instructions, this is the one they want you to use, and there's no other mention of this one there. So this one, again, is just left as odd man out. Which is interesting, because I guess they could have also used the space for an antenna base, but, you know, <laughs> I'm just uh, loitering here. Uh, as for the components, nicely detailed. If anything, I'll just go ahead and recycle this part and utilize it on one of the other older M60A1 builds that I have in the stash. But again, I just wanted to let anyone know who's working on this kit here and you encounter this component of spare, don't panic. This is basically as per the kit's design. So starting with the model's running gear, everything you see here is stock with the Academy kit and there's nothing really much to mention. The wheels go together very easily and even though these are the newer design ones, they still have the exact same design as the legacy versions with the use of a polycap. Just like with the other motorized converted Patton and M60 base vehicles. The axle that's used to hold up the front center wheel over here, this originally was a plastic peg on the static configuration model. However, for the motorized conversion, I always swap these out for a metal rod that runs across the inside portion of the vehicle, which gives the model much more stability and much more structure, which is definitely going to be important because the model is functional. This is just nothing more than an eighth of an inch rod, be it steel or brass. I'm a little hazy on which material I use for this one over here. Regardless, this was what's utilized on this model. And oddly enough, this was something that Tamiya themselves designed into this kit when they released it back in 1970 for the exact same reasons. Clearly the biggest revision that was made to the suspension outside of the motorization aspect, but yet it's still linked to the motorization aspect, is with the replacement of the original kit supplied Lincoln Lane tracks with the single piece vinyl tracks here from Tamiya. Now that the tracks are painted, weathered, and fitted in place, you really get to appreciate how they look in comparison to the original kit supply ones, which again are the biggest hindrance on the stock kit. In fact, if anyone out there you know, works for Academy and is watching this video, for the love of God, please amend your kit and throw in a set of tracks like this here. It would just make the model all that much more better. This is jumping ahead a little bit. However, there are some side effects to the aftermarket tracks. First is with budget reasons, you are going to have to acquire another aftermarket kit in order to build the standard kit that we have here. And this is something that some people just don't have a budget for, given some you know economic circumstances. And the other is with complexity. The complexity of the model now is going to be elevated because these workable tracklings do require a little bit of hand fitting as well as a little bit of extra time in order to you know remove off of the sprues and assemble and assemble properly. So these are something that will add to the build in the build's difficulty in that regard. Having said that, they are definitely 100% recommended over the stock kit tracks all day long.
jumping back to the tracks that we have here, even though these tracks were designed and were originally supplied with a Tamiya M48A3 model, they transition into the M60 kit here without any sort of problems or any sort of modifications needed. They just simply get thrown on as you would with the original track set that this kit would originally have been developed and supplied with. I, I'm referring to specifically in the original M60A1 format. As for the paint and weathering work on the track, this is done in my usual format that is seen on many other builds that are found on this channel with tracks that are a similar design. Also, I want to take the opportunity to point out that you don't want to paint, or I should say you never want to paint, single piece vinyl tracks here with either rattle can spray paint or also enamels both of which can potentially harm the material that the tracks are made in. And I have had experiences where the tracks brittled up and decayed on me either immediately after the build was completed or several years down the road, neither of which are ideal for the situation. So I always found the best that these tracks are best painted with acrylic paints. And for me, the acrylic paint that I use is Tamiya Flat Black, the one in the little jar specifically. The flat black is applied to both of the inner and outer surfaces of the track via the airbrush. Once the airbrush paint is applied, it dries for a nice flat surface, and it's a great surface to then add the extra paintwork to, bringing up to the results that we have here. As for weathering the tracks themselves, well, these American tracks here are a combination of two materials. We have steel and we have rubber. We have a steel skeletal structure which contains the inner sections here that are underneath these rubber pads where we have the inner bars, the bushings, and then on the outside portion that's visible we have the tooth as well as the two end connectors. On the inner portion here you will see a skeletal structure found in this section right over here. Then the pads themselves are over molded with rubber leaving you for the chevron pattern here on the face and the inner track pad found on the inside. When it comes time for weathering this pattern of track for the rubber sections, I always go ahead and apply a thin diluted layer of flat white via the airbrush and once it dries it gives you for the results that you see here which mimic very closely the look of used and worn rubber. For the metal sections, I like to render them on my patent builds in being a rusty type format. Now this is something that flies in a little bit of contradiction compared to some of the other builds out there where like on World War II tanks, I tend not to rust my tracks. However, for a vehicle from this era, you will tend to see rust on the tracks because they have been around for a longer period of time compared to the World War II tanks which entered into the field and really were only there for you know six months to basically maybe a year or so at most. So on these type of tracks here, they were in the field for a much longer period of time and because of that, they tend to have more surface rust on them compared to the World War II counterparts. So for my patent builds, I always paint the metal sections to replicate rust. Now, if you're trying to build your model and you're going for a more cleaner or fresher type depiction, in that case, you don't necessarily want to go with the rusty trick and for that type of a build, you're going to want to go with more of a fresh oxide type look and for that another painting option to go with is to paint the metal sections with a color like to me a nato black or something similar along those lines and with that color added and once it dries you will have a clear difference between the two materials and it's something that is definitely noticeable and it's something that will greatly help the build as opposed to just leaving everything over painted with flat black also on this location over here, you can see the mud slicks that have been added to the sprockets. And again, you can really see just how much extra detailing they give the build as opposed to just leaving them without the mud slits present. And one other thing to mention on this side here, you can see I took a little swipe of silver paint and added it to the recesses here of the horn guide as clearly this is something that would not exactly hold paint very frequently on the real vehicle after a little bit of use. Hopping to the rear of the vehicle, you get to see the kit supply details and everything you see here is stock with the model and they are actually very nicely rendered. One thing that's unique is that on this kit here, the taillights are integrally molded into the rear plate here, so they are not a separate piece that needs to be glued on as they are on the standard M60A1 kit. The pieces are nicely rendered in that they have the cat's eye lens detailing and when you're painting them you want to be sure to paint them appropriately. This is a place where I've seen a lot of builds out there make a mistake and a lot of builders either just ignore them outright or they just paint the entire thing with red and call it a day and that is definitely something that is not going to help you out. On these cat's eye lenses they're a very simple format to, to render and something that's basically rinse, wash and repeat from 
almost most of the military vehicles from the World War II time frame all the way up to today. On these vehicles over here with this pattern of the taillight, the bottom one where it's that little rectangle, that's painted in silver. And then on the left hand side, the top one is painted in red, gloss red specifically. And on the opposite side, it's the blackout light, and I just add a little swipe of gloss black there in order to replicate that detailing. This is a very easy thing to add, but again, it's one that's commonly overlooked. However, if you just take the time and paint the pieces appropriately, again, it just polishes the build and makes it look all that much better. One other thing to mention is with these little descending guards that we have coming off of the two tin work. This is an iconic bit of detailing found on the Patton and the M60 family of vehicle. And this is something that you have to be very creative with, specifically if you're making the model operable. So normally when the model static, you just glue these to the fenders over here and you call it a day. However, because this model does have a gearbox and you do have to get access to the internals, you know, every once in a while, this is something that can be a bit of a pain. So on this model here, I went with my patented format on rendering these sections out. And that is with the use, or I should say with the technique of gluing these guards here to the lower hull itself. However, they look like that they are connected to the top, but in actuality, that is just not the case. As you can see, I can lift up the entire upper hull here and these pieces stay where they are without any sort of problems of them potentially breaking. And when the model is fully assembled in the way we have it here, they blend in completely seamlessly and look like they are just connected to the top tin work as it would have been originally intended on the kit. It's really a great way of having your cake and eating it too. Moving up takes to the exhaust manifold and this is something that is, I'm just going to briefly touch upon on the M48A2 and onward type vehicles like the A3, the M60, the A1 and also the A2, not to mention the A3, we have the same exact exhaust manifold system. And again, also true on the M103A2, which is important because that there's a new kit out there and yes, I do want to grab one. So back to this one over here. On these patterns of vehicles, we have the exhaust manifolds and they just stick out right behind of the two grading sections that we have here. When the vehicle is in operation, you will see a little bit of exhaust emit from these two locations, and after a while you will get the soot buildup found in these two areas in a circular manner. This is something that a lot of people tend to overweather on their builds, where they, you know, black out everything back here, and that's just really not the case. Specifically, if you've ever seen a well-used example of a M60 family of vehicle, they tend to only have the soot found in these two location specifically. So for this one here, I went ahead and replicated that via the airbrush. Hopping to the front of the model takes to the lower section. These are the kit supplied tow hooks and these are the improved kit ones, the ones that have the little hole integrally drilled on and they just simply get installed to the model without any sort of changes being necessary. Remove off the sprue and mount on accordingly. Moving up takes us to the pike nose and this is something that is probably one of the hallmarks on the Tamiya pattern, in this case Academy, but the Tamiya pattern of M60 kits is that you can make them operable and not have any sort of indication that the vehicle could come apart. That's just the way Tamiya designed this kit. With the way the upper and lower hulls go together, the seam that would normally be found in this section over here is so precisely made that it looks almost seamless. I mean, unless I pointed out, you would have never realized that the upper and lower hulls come apart. And this is why I stated many times of all of the models that are out there that are on the market that can be motorized converted or RC converted, the Tamiya pattern of M60 is probably one of the best to do so because of this reason. You can have the model be operable and yet not have any unsightly seams found in these sections over here where the upper and lower hulls have to meet and disconnect. Carry on with the remainder of the details. Nothing really much to talk about over here. I already mentioned the brush guard supports and here you can see what they look like fully painted and weathered and as you can see they do give the front section of the model a lot of extra detailing and again these are absent on the stock academy and Tamiya kits. The headlights nothing much to mention just you want to appropriately paint them the one light is the blackout light and the other one is the standard white light very simple format to figure out and once you paint them with the appropriate colors they always give the model a nice little bit of color. On the topic of giving the model color, another thing that you want to pay attention to, it's also something that's commonly overlooked, are the front bumpers. On this pattern of vehicle, the front sections here, these tips are actually made out of an industrial rubber, and this is something that would be best painted to replicate in that format. A lot of individuals out there, they just overpaint everything, and they forget that the 
material here would be the rubber found on the real example. Now, this is something that's not necessarily inaccurate because there are you know, cases where the entire vehicle is repainted and they just overpaint everything, and that is true. However, in my opinion, if you go ahead and paint them black like I've done over here, it just gives the vehicle just that much more extra color as well as a little extra detailing. Also, if you are going to go with the overpainted route, that's cool too. However, you want to weather them accordingly. And what I mean by that is that even though they would get overpainted, the paint would not last very long on these sections here and would flake off very, very quickly. So if you're gonna go with the overpainted format, you can do that, but you want to weather the pieces accordingly where you have the black just you know chipping out and poking through the added layers of paint. Also, while on the topic of fittings that are generally ignored on most builds out there is the fire extinguisher box. The fire extinguisher box is very nicely rendered on this example over here. And only thing you have to do is with a little swipe of red paint with a very precision paintbrush, you go ahead and paint the little handles found on the inside of the box. These are found red on almost all these vehicles and it's something that always gives a little bit of extra color pop to the vehicle at hand. Carrying along takes to the heater exhaust manifold. Again, stock with the kit. The only thing I did was with a pin vise, I drilled out this section over here to just give it that much little extra detailing. And the rest of the detailing just comes from the paint and the weathering work. As you can see, I've replicated here. Moving topside takes to the rear engine deck. And this is probably one of the cooler aspects on this family of vehicle. And it's one of my personal favorites. But the thing that I want to mention involves this little inset that we have right here. This is normally the location for the travel lock. And on a standard M60 with the 105, when the vehicle would be in transport configuration, the turret would be Rotated all the way around, you clamp the barrel in place, and you know, you can call it a day. However, on the Starship, obviously, that's something that can't really be done because the barrel is so stubby. Because of that, the travel lock is absent on the Starship renditions. However, on the stock kit here, there are provisions that are found in place, again, to carry over from all the other M60 kits that this upper hull tooling is used on, where we have provisions for mounting on the travel lock detailing. Obviously, it's not going to be needed for this model, so you do, as the builder, have to amputate these sections over here and then sand them nice and flush in order to give you the appearance that would be more appropriate for an A2 Starship. This procedure here is something that could potentially cause some issues for some builders out there, specifically ones that don't exactly have a whole lot of tools in their toolbox for working in this type of confined space and removing the amount of material that was present on the moldings. In order to get this piece cleaned off, I use a Dremel with a high speed removal bit, as well as also some fine sandpaper and a little bit of red putty in order to polish everything down to the way you see it here. Once the removal work is completed, the model definitely looks much better in comparison to leaving that molded in section present in place. However, if you do not have the skill sets required, that's something that you're just going to probably best leave there and then just, you know, have the model take a little bit of a hit in that regard. But it's better than the alternative of potentially screwing this area up and something that could snowball pretty quickly downhill if that circumstance does arise. So this is something for the builder out there to definitely watch out for as simple as it does sound. Moving forward takes to the air filtration boxes. Again, these are the units that I touched upon before and I did drill these sections out. It's one of those things that it just makes me feel better that I went in and undertook. However, you don't really get a chance to see it, but it's one of those things that it's better there than without. And moving to the top takes to the most iconic and most interesting and distinctive feature found on this family of vehicle, and that's definitely the turret. So the turret, is something that went together very, very well. And as I touched upon before, it's all 100% new Academy tooling. The detailing is excellent. It's a nicely detailed piece outside of the small little quirks that I did touch upon earlier, namely the visor and the chute not being <laughs> represented in the instructions. Outside of that though, it does assemble pretty easily. One thing that I like is that this kit does give you the configuration where we have the tarpaulin. And with the way Academy rendered the tarpaulin was very interesting in that the whole unit articulates as one complete section. And although this is technically inaccurate because you know the tarpaulin mounts would not move on the real vehicle, this is something that I personally do like because generally on vehicles like this where they have a tarpaulin, when you do have this type of a configuration, generally the mantle is gonna be stuck in one position and it's gonna be frozen there 
because you know pieces are made out of standard plastic however with this this is really the best of both worlds where you're getting your cake and eating it too where you do get all of the nice little tarpaulin details that are integrally molded in as well as also the tarpaulin snaps that are integrally molded in but you still have the opportunity to raise and lower the unit and it's something that doesn't really cause any sort of an eyesore once done and again i got to give props to academy with the engineering that went into this piece with the way the kit is designed you do not have the option of rendering this without the tarpaulin in place and if you do you are going to have to fabricate the tarpaulin mounts that you see right here that are on the side portions here of the of the mantlet it's not impossible to fabricate however in my opinion if you are hell-bent on replicating a starship without the tarpaulin in place it's probably best to just roll with the dragon kit as that one doesn't have the provisions or i should say doesn't have the tarpaulin at all but it does have the provisions for the tarpaulin that is absent carry on to the front you can see the mantlet details and they're very very nicely done the kits again very excellently detailed in this regard all of the lenses are there you do have the option to have the rangefinder here with the hatch in the open or closed state and if it's in the open state you do have the nice little optic detailing underneath as for the main tube this is a single piece molding as i touched upon before and that's actually really nice. There's no extra seam work to contend with outside of a small little mold line that runs across the top and bottom portions of the tube. But this is something that is very easily and quickly polished away with just some fine sandpaper and not a whole lot of elbow grease. After a minute or so, the piece was fully polished down and was just ready for installation. Also, as I touched upon before, this kit gives you the option of rendering it in two options where we have the later version here with the bore evacuator or the earlier version with the standard straight tube that emerges from the mantlet. The choice is up to you on which one you would want to replicate. However, since I already have the Dragon one in my collection that has the early version depicted, I might as well roll with the more evacuator version for this one example. Bouncing back to the tarpaulin, you can see the tarpaulin details are very nicely rendered and I simply just painted and weathered them accordingly. From there, it takes us to the tow cables. And the tow cables, as I touched upon before, were mounted to the model before it hit off into paint, which is something that I don't utilize on my other builds. And on my usual builds, these are the type of details that get fitted at the tail end of the model and are painted and weathered off the build and then added in that type of format. However, with the circumstances that this build gives you, it's best done where you go ahead and install it paint it and then weather accordingly. As you can see, I was able to fully weather and paint these details over here and they came out absolutely perfect. This is something that does take a bit of patience. You have to have good paint brushes for and on top of that, the paint has to be at the proper consistency. As I've touched upon on a few other builds, if the, and I'm also gonna touch upon this later on with this build, but the paint consistency is going to be paramount. If it's too runny, it's gonna run all over the place. If it's too thick, it's gonna be too chunky. And if the brush is crap, you're not gonna be able to get into certain areas and you will have some blind spots that are exposed. And what I mean by blind spots are just areas that do not receive the paint work that matches the rest of the cabling. So this is something that the builder does have to be on the ball with, but if you are, you are definitely gonna have some very excellent results. If I pan to the opposite side here, you get to see what the cabling looks like on the reverse side of the model and just gives it so much extra detailing. You can also see, by the way, those scratch built clips that I was referencing earlier and how once they are mounted to the vehicle, it really improves it tenfold. While on this section, you also get to see the searchlight. Now that's fully painted and weathered, you get to see what the end result looks like. On many of my other builds that are similar to this, I always mention that the searchlight is something that is removed and because of that it wouldn't be uncommon to see the searchlight painted in a different color compared to the remainder of the vehicle and that is exactly the technique that i undertook here the vehicle is painted in a murk camo scheme but i went ahead and left the searchlight in its standard base dark olive drab this is a way to give your model extra color pop and it's something that always gives the model just that much little extra bit of character and uniqueness compared to blending everything in with the paintwork as for the detail work, well, I mentioned before, it's really nice in that it has some excellent photo etch sections that get glued on. However, the front face section is something that was a bit tricky. As I showed before, the lens is something that has to be cut to shape by the builder. And although the kit does give you a nice little template to cut the piece out, it's still something that's a bit harder than it looks. And with the way you see it here was the best I was able to get with the 
circumstances that I was dealt with. Fortunately, it went on pretty good, you know, it does definitely does the job and fits on pretty well. For the searchlight, it does have some certain ways to paint it. The inside is actually all black. As you can see, the walls as well as the outer portion here of the lens body is black. The reflector would be a bright, shiny silver color on the real unit, and I went ahead and painted it accordingly on the model here. Then on the lens, there's actually a red rubber gasket that is found on the section where the lens makes contact with the frame, and it's gonna be really tricky to see on this model over here, but the red gasket detailing was indeed rendered and painted on. It's one of those things where you see it if you, you know, look at the model in a certain angle, but it's again, something that gives it some extra added detailing. The other thing to mention with the lens is that when I glued it in place, I used white glue. White glue is probably the best material for gluing on or fixing on clear lens details like this because you do not have any sort of worry about causing collateral damage. If you utilize super glue, you're gonna get, well, one, you have the potential if you're installing it, you put in wrong and it's just not gonna fit right now. You have glue globs around the ends or potentially even a thumbprint in the middle, which is definitely something that's less than ideal. And plus with super glue, once it hardens, it you know has that gassy type uh, uh, effect and that's something that's not going to help out with a lens. Model glue can cause some clunks and something that again will hurt the look visually. So this is why I opt for white glue. White glue does not harm the plastic at all. So if there's a mishap or something you can simply just pop it off, wipe it clean, rinse, wash and repeat, literally. Also when the white glue dries, when it's you know appropriately put on, it dries in a very transparent or a translucent manner, and it's something that just blends in very, very well. That's probably the two biggest reasons why I recommend white glue for adhering on components like this. And as you can see on this build here, it definitely did the job without any problems. The other bit of detailing I want to mention with the searchlight involves the power cable. And this is a bit of detailing that is absent on the kit. However, it's one that it definitely sorely needs. And once added, yeah, it just improves the build tenfold. So on all of these type of vehicles, the Xenon searchlight is externally powered with a large power cable. And the power cable that you see here is scratch built. I utilize very thin silicone electrical wiring that we have right here. It's a very thin gauge. I actually have the Amazon link to this wire in the video description listed below. I've utilized it on a few other builds for the same purpose and it is awesome. It's an excellent bit of wire and it looks so great on one of these models. And also because it's silicone, it's very flexible and very pliable and I could get it to the configuration that we have here. For the end connectors that you see, these are actually made out of small pieces of shrink tubing that I went ahead, cut the shape, shrunk down and then secure them to these two locations and as you can see the shrink tubing is painted in silver as the end connectors would be on the real unit. As for the wire itself, this is left in its El Natural color and there's no need to paint it whatsoever. Once everything is added in place, you could really see on just how much it improves the build and really polishes up very nicely. Moving along takes us to a feature that I went ahead and modified on this build and was something that gives the model just a little bit of extra functionality, and that is with the turret crew hatches. The Starship is very iconic of having those two crew hatches found on the side portions that are very low in their overall profile. And on the model over here, the hatches are very nicely detailed with both interior and external details. However, the hatches are intended to be glued in either the open or closed state. However, with the way the hatches are designed, it does leave the room for the possibility of making them operable. And the way this was done with the same method I touched upon before with the cupola with the use of a pin vise and a very f uh, fine Dremel bit. Once the holes were drilled out, a small little pin was added in place and because of that, now the hatches here are fully functional. It's a bit useless of a feature, admittedly, but you know, it's one that I personally enjoy adding to this build. And on this build here, all of the crew hatches are fully operable. That would include the driver's hatch on the front, the cupola hatch on the top, and as we just saw, the two side hatches found on the turret. And at the very tail end of the turret, I was saving for this portion of the video because this was by far the hardest, most tricky, and trying bit of construction on the entire build. And that is the gypsy rack. Wow, was this freaking hard. <laughs> yeah, the gypsy rack here was a gigantic 
pain in the ass. This thing was just ridiculously hard to put together. And the fact that I got it built, got it built to this condition with the photo etch, with the unit being properly assembled and not breaking anything, nothing short of a miracle. <laughs> not, nothing short of a miracle. Yeah, this was definitely something that was not easy at all. And this is not on Academy. This is just the nature of the beast. This is definitely something that's going to separate the novice from the pro on this particular build. The gypsy rack on the Starship is very, very intricate. It's the most intricate gypsy rack in the Patton family that I know of. And which is saying a lot because the standard gypsy rack is a bit, you know, tricky to put together on a standard M60. But on the Starship over here, it's in another league. It's definitely the final boss. With the way the gypsy rack is designed, you have cubbies and subdividers and then bulkheads that all interlock with each other, forming this very unique geometric shape. On top of that, you also have three rails on each side. And these rails here are very, very frail and are very, very finely molded. Every bit of component that you see here had to have been carefully removed off the sprue and deburred. And that's something that already is a challenge when you're dealing with, you know, molding like this. And fortunately, I was able to do it, but you have to be on your A game. You need a nice pair of burlesque snips or clean cut snips, and you're going to need a nice sharp needle file in order to carefully polish everything down. And carefully is definitely going to be the word of the day. If you're too rough, if you're not holding the thing in the right spot, the plastic's going to snap on you, and then you're going to be in big trouble. Outside of that, you have these internal cubbies that we have here, and these, you know, remove off of the sprue simpler enough, but are immensely complex with how they go together, and it's very, you can be easily confused. It's the type of thing where you want to build each one individually, because the, there's many parts here that look alike, and they're not, and they will definitely bite you when it comes time for in installation. The third thing to mention is fitting these little bulkheads and fishing them through not just one, but three of these finely molded rock, uh, rails. It's definitely something that is much more easily said than done. It took me like three or four attempts to try to get everything in the configuration that you see here. And I was able to do it. I, I still don't know how I was uh, able to pull it off, but I was. I have a lot of experience in this, so I was able to do the job. Having said that, this is definitely not for the faint of heart. I'm going to say right now, this is not going to be for a beginner, and it's probably not even going to be for most intermediates out there. That's how hard this part is. And that's not even all of it. There's still one more. And that is the photo etch. The photo etch is very nicely molded, or nicely rendered, but you have to implant each one in the appropriate location. You have to bend it to shape and then you have to secure it in place without, without adding any sort of extra glues to certain locations. And again, everything I just said is far more easily said than done. And I'm still not done yet. <laughs> the last thing to mention about the PE is that because it is so finely rendered that the meshwork can be plugged up with paint ridiculously easily. And you have to be on the ball with the paintwork. And I'll be circling back to that when I go over the varnishing and all that stuff. Because, again, the fact that I was able to put this together and not have it get ruined, just just a miracle <laughs> on this one. I'm glad I, I did it. Uh, would I do it again? I really don't want to. But uh, I'm glad I was able to build it on this model. So outside of that, again, but this all leaves for a silver lining. And that is the Gypsy Rack is excellent. It looks gorgeous. The detailing on it is superb. It's just a beautifully rendered component, albeit hard to build, but totally worth it if you can pull it off. So inside the Gypsy Rack here, we have the smoke grenade launchers, and they are very excellently rendered. They have the right shape to them. They have their rubber caps on them. Everything is where it needs to be, and the piece overall is very nicely executed. We have here on the outside a jerry can that's kit supplied. You know, simple turret mounted jerry can type set up with a tray as well as with the belt again two piece assembly you want to make sure everything is polished away seam wise and then when you're painting it paint the tray accordingly as well as also the strap which is which would be on this pattern vehicle a olive green nylon type webbing which you can see how it was rendered on this example here 
We also have the provisions for mounting spare tracks. These are kit supply, and these were the only kit supply tracks that were utilized on this build for the reasons that I touched upon before. Moving up from the gypsy rack takes us to the antenna bases. As I touched upon before, the Starship here has two antenna bases. We have the version over here, the name eludes me at the moment, which is oddly enough because I actually produced this in 1-6 scale, but here we have the version here, and on this antenna base, the bottom part is made out of plastic, and like an olive green or an olive drab plastic, and then the stem itself would be made out of rubber. The center portion was drilled out, and the rubber section is just a small little piece of floor wire that is painted black. On the other antenna, this was the one that I said before that was conspicuously missing on the kit, but now that is added in place, you can see just how complete it renders the back section. So much so that it is a glaring omission, and again, it just boggles the mind how Academy just missed that. So the piece here is that Resin 1 that I touched upon before, and as I touched upon before, the Tamiya pattern one, or the one originally that would have been found on the M60 kit, just drops on without any sort of problems and just completes the look very, very well. The section was drilled out, as I mentioned before, and the floor wire was added, giving you the detailing here for the antenna, which again is something that's customarily seen on my builds. Also on the antennas, like I frequently mentioned, I always like to paint them with a different shade of olive green or olive drab compared to the remainder of the vehicle, just to give it, again, that much more character pop and color pop compared to just painting everything with the standard base coat. Moving upward takes to the Commander's Cupola, and there's nothing really much to add on outside of what I touched upon earlier. Outside of that, now that it's fully painted and weathered and completed, you really get a good look and view of the component in its final form. One thing that I did not have on before is the M85, and although the M85 is a complete failure and was definitely inferior to the M2HB, damn it, there's something to be said about aesthetics, and the M85 is definitely one of the more aesthetic HMGs that have ever been designed. On the kit one over here, it definitely has all of those nice aesthetic features that are present, which would include the kick-ass flash suppressor, which is right there on the front. The kit has some very nice moldings on the section over here where you can see those grooves that are molded in the sides, and it is also drilled out, again, from the get-go, so no mods are going to be necessary by the builder. As for the tarplin itself, again, just like with the one on the main armament, the M85 tarplin is very nicely rendered, and it has all of the folds and little nooks and crannies that would be appropriate for the rubberized canvas material that the real unit would have been made in. Just like with the main tarpaulin, I painted and weathered it with the exact same techniques, giving you the results that you see here. Also at this time over here, you get to see all of the optic and periscope details, and as I generally mention on these builds, on my builds I always like to render these details in gloss black. Some individuals out there like to paint them in blue, but from my personal experience from crawling and seeing these vehicles in person, as well as studying many of the real ones in person, it always seems like that when the vehicle's all buttoned up, they tend to just be the gloss black color that you see here. Also at this time, I just want to point out that yes, the cupola visor is still fully functional. And I can display the model in either of these configurations, closed or open. One last thing I want to mention about the cupola is with the little hooks. On the front and on the rear portion, we have these tiny little lift hooks that are present and these are kit supplied and they are very, very finely molded. Much along the lines as like the gypsy rack, but worse because they are much smaller. These are the type of things that can easily fling off the Lost Partia, so you have to stay on the ball when it comes time for removing them off of the sprue, cleaning them off, and then securing them to the model and hoping, dear God, that they don't pop off during the, you know, any time in between installation and final completion. And on the model here, fortunately that was the case, and I didn't have to replace them with metal ones because I accidentally lost one. And yes, these are the type of things where if one flings off the Lost Partia, you're screwed, and you're just going to basically then replace all three of them with metal ones, because at that point you have to, or else they just won't, you could tell which one is not like the other. So to keep continuity, you it's best if that happens to replace all three. Fortunately, they're easily fabricated. You just drill two little holes with the pin vise, bend some thin floor wire, and presto, you now have your lift rings. And the last thing to mention about the cupola is yes, as we saw before, the hatch was made to be fully operable because I need to get access to the switch that we have right there. So that's all there is to the detailing aspect of this build, and this takes us to the paintwork. And obviously for this model here, you can see it's rendered in the Merc camouflage scheme, which of course for a Starship is again 
almost law that it has to get one. However, it does look pretty sexy in all dark olive drab, but you know, I do have some other starships in the stash that will be getting that type of configuration. For this one here, I went with the Winter Verdant color scheme, which is something that would definitely not be out of place for this pattern of vehicle. As for the paintwork, this was done utilizing many of the same techniques that I've brushed upon in other Merc Camo vehicles that are found on this channel in both 172 as well as also 135 for the exact same reasons. For the actual paint itself, this is the Winter Verdant paint scheme, and for the main base coat, I went with Tamiya Olive Green. This was applied via the airbrush. However, the remainder of the paintwork, specifically the camo, was all done with the paintbrush. And this was again referenced in the Sergeant York video. In fact, this and the Sergeant York, as well as a few other Merc Camo painted vehicles that have, haven't been posted yet, were all painted and built at the same time. So you're gonna see quite a bit of crossover between the next few builds. So for the paint, like I said before, this was to me acrylic and it was olive green. However, for the brown, this was Mission Models. And this is a paint brand that I've been referencing quite a bit lately because, well, for good reason. Their paints are excellent. They really did fill the void that was left by Model Master, but their paints are much better because they are acrylic and not enamel. The Mission Model paint, is just good quality stuff and it's definitely the type of thing that really really will make your model shine. The paint specifically, the reason why I went with the Mission Models besides of the good quality is they have this color which is specifically the Merc Brown. And in the past, this paint here would have been a godsend because if you wanted to make a Merc Camo tank, you have to cobble your own paints together. And there was all these different formulas out there to mix from all these different brands. But having a bottle of this stuff ready to go, it just, it's so valuable. It really is something that was greatly needed in the hobby. And now that we have it, mwah, it's magnifique. So the paint itself was all applied via the paintbrush. So every blotch here was applied. And the Mission Models paint applies very, very well. It's very finely diluted and applies very easily with the paintbrush. It did take one or two coats in order to, or I should say two or three coats in order to get the opacity to the way you see it here. But once completed, it definitely yielded from some excellent results. The other paintwork was also done with a paintbrush, which would include the little white leaflets as well as the black leaflets like you see here. The black was to me a flat black and the white was just exterior latex that I diluted and got to the consistency where I could apply it in the following format. With all paints properly diluted, once it, it dries, it leaves for a smooth glass-like appearance that you see present on this build. Like I was touching upon before with the cable work, this is where the paint consistency is going to be absolutely paramount. Too runny, and it's gonna be a mess, too thick, and it's gonna look like Zemrit, neither of which is something that you want. So, you really wanna be on the ball with that. The other thing you wanna be on the ball with, again, is a good quality paintbrush. If you're using an older paintbrush, make sure it doesn't have any loose flingies on it or something. You wanna make sure that the paintbrush is nice and tight. The tighter the brush, the tighter the paint job is gonna look. Also, I just wanna mention, when it comes to Merc Camouflage schemes, you do have some options available. Some Merc Camos were applied via the spray gun, others were applied via paintbrush. It just depends on who was painting the vehicle and what equipment they had at that time. There are lots of examples out there of the entire paint job being done in a paintbrush. There are also lots of examples of the entire paint job being done in a, in a spray gun format. And then there's examples of a mix between where the blotches may be applied via the airbrush, but the, sh the little leaflets are applied with the paintbrush and vice versa. Quite a bit of options available for the builder, which is fantastic. For my personal taste, however, I've done both, but I prefer the Merc with the paintbrush method just because it looks that much sharper. It really does look like a nice sharp camo pattern and it really yields for some excellent results. Probably the biggest challenge with the paintwork, however, involves again, the gypsy rack. So you have to paint <laughs> the gypsy rack, obviously with the camo. And again, because of the fine perforations found in this portion over here, you wanna make sure that the, you're on the ball with the paint because if it's too thick, it's gonna plug up these holes over here and it's just not gonna do you any favors. The other thing that's important to point out, specifically with the Mission Miles paint, is that it does have one Achilles heel and that is, it is extremely volatilely 
sensitive to moisture. And that is a big problem, specifically since the weathering that goes on it is all done with acrylics and washes, which is all water-based, but also because the markings are water slide decals. And you kind of have to add water to the surface in order to add your decal. And if the paint is water soluble, you can quickly see how that's a problem. So for this paint here, like I touched upon in the other videos, you need to use varnish. Varnish is going to be your best friend. For the varnish, I went with VMS Matte Varnish. Again, I've touched upon this in a number of videos for good reason. I love the paint, it, or I should say I love this product. It is awesome. The VMS was applied via the airbrush before the decals were applied. Oddly enough, after the tank was weathered though, I was still able to do the airbrushing with the filters and all that, and I didn't have any problems with that in that regard. My washers are very, very thin. I don't have any drips or anything on them, so I was able to get the model weathered without any sort of issues. And for the weathering, jumping or retracing my tracks a little bit, I use uh, uh, sun fading filters as well as double edging filters. The sun fading is done with some diluted cream, and I also use to me a flat black in a diluted format in order to get the counter shading effects that you see here. Unlike some people out there, I don't like to use the counter shading and then you add the translucent layers over that. I hate that technique. Me personally, I like to start with the model being opaque and then I add the, the effects afterwards, leaving for the results that you see here. Also, of course, the model was thoroughly primed with flat black spray paint before the initial base coat. That is something I, that I always mention. Back to the varnish work. So after the weathering work was concluded, before the decals get applied, the entire vehicle is varnished with its first coat of VMS. This is done to seal the Mission Models paint to make it impervious to any sort of moisture. When it comes time for varnishing, you have to be, again, super careful on the damn gypsy rack because if the consistency or if the distance of the airbrush isn't on tune, you're going to get these areas plugged up and it's going to cause some problems. Fortunately, I don't know how the hell this happened, but I was able to make through just fine by, you know, holding the airbrush at a nice distance away so that basically by the time the varnish got to the surface in this section over here, it was just a light dusting and it wasn't able to plug up any of the grill work or I should say any of the mesh work found on the gypsy rack. Once the varnish was completed, it actually does two effects. Again, it seals the surface, protecting it from any sort of moisture, but it also has a great feature of, again, just flattening the paint out, making it look as like, you know, flat as possible, not necessarily sheen, but I'm just talking about with brush strokes and just things like that. And the other thing that it does is a, a very happy accident, did on the Sergeant New York also, is that if you look at the paint, it has this mottled look to it. Like it's got little spots, little discolorations here and there. And this was done after the varnishing was completed. And honestly, it just made the paint job look all that much more killer. It was a very, very happiest of accidents indeed. So once the, the varnish was added, it was then time to apply the markings. The markings are all the kit supply water slide decals and they went on in the appropriate locations. The quality of the markings were excellent. It's actually very good markings. They went on without any sort of problems. And once they were on, they were then secured with a second more surgical coating of the varnish, leaving for the end result that we have here. And again, the markings on this build really didn't cause any sort of issues. So they were very nicely done in that regard. So that's basically all there is to the model itself. However, as I mentioned before, this thing is motorized. In order to turn it on, let's go ahead and flip the switch. Right now the batteries are all hooked up. I'm gonna use this cartridge over here in order to do that, so. As you can see, it runs pretty good, for a tank that is. Let me go ahead and flip the switch and have it go in reverse. Right now, by the way, it's still very fresh. I'm pretty sure the more this thing is driven, the more the model will be able to run in a more efficient manner. Having said that, for a model that's been turned on or has been run very limited, I think it runs pretty well. It would also probably help if I had a fresh pair of batteries, but right now I'm actually running low on double A's. I've been gobbling them up on other projects. So the batteries in here are probably, I guess, at the midway point. But regardless, the tank still runs. Oop. <laughs> there we go, I think I can. Yeah, the batteries are a little weak, guys, but regardless, even in a weakened state, the model still performs pretty well, I find. 
and it definitely performs a lot better compared to the original kit offering, which was completely dead static. I also want to take the opportunity to point out that this is not the only Academy M60A2 Starship that is operable on YouTube. There is another mad lad out there that was able to take the exact same kit as this one here, only he was able to take it a step further from what I did, and he was able to make the thing fully radio controlled with full turret functions, and my hat is most certainly off to that guy. There are a number of individuals out there that do RC, stack to RC conversions in 135, and those guys have always impressed me just due to the amount of difficulty it takes to try to convert one of these things into an operable state, yet alone making it RC and making it RC with a full option package. That, that is something that has always impressed me for some very good reasons. The video is out there on YouTube. I'll probably throw the link to that in the video description just below just to give that guy some love because, you know, again, I appreciate good work when I see it. So as I stated repeatedly in this video, this model here... Part of the reason why I went ahead and obtained it was because I wanted to really compare and contrast to the Dragon kit that was around at the same time. And, well, as we all know, I have the Dragon one in my collection. In fact, here's the build right over here. The Dragon model, I went ahead and built back in about 2015 or so, when the kits were still relatively new. And this model here is the subject matter of its own model showcase video, and I recommend checking that out in order to get a good idea on what the base kit supplies with, as well as all the other modifications and things that I mentioned in that video in order to get the model built up to the condition that we have here. However, now that I have the Academy one side by side, we could compare and contrast and you can really get my honest opinion on which one is better and for what reasons. One other thing I do want to touch upon goes back to the paintwork. As I touched upon before, there are two versions to render a Merc camouflage scheme. One is by going with this route here, which is all done via the airbrush, while on this one here, this was utilizing the paintbrush techniques that I touched upon earlier in the video. As for which one's accurate, again, both of which are more than accurate as both techniques were utilized to apply the camouflage pattern to the real tanks, as I again referenced earlier in this video. So having the two examples side by side, I first want to say that both will build into an excellent rendition of the M60A2 Starship. However, now that the two are side by side, you really get to see some of the shortcomings on one kit, as well as also some of the shortcomings that the other kit does have. At the end of the day, this is more or less like a boxing match, and the two are just duking it out. And as for which one stands on top, well, that depends on certain key features. The first point that I'm going to bring up involves the tin work, and this is where the Dragon Kit beats the Academy Kit hands down. And this is what I was saying before. The Academy Kit, the tooling here is from 1970. This one here is from 2015. So this one here does have some better mold technology compared to the older tooling counterpart. The older tooling counterpart is still polished up and still keeping up and just refuses to, you know, sit down and get put by the wayside, which is, it is admirable. and just shows just how good the original tooling was found on the original kit, or I should say with the original kit's DNA. But there are some shortcomings with it. The first is with the extenders, or I should say the fender mounts. Here you get to see what the fender mounts look like on the original tooling kit here where it's just integrally molded into the piece. Does it do the detailing? Yeah, it does it just fine, and it's perfectly suffice for, you know, most 99.9% .9 of the builds that are out there. The other fender supports are just molded into the sections over here. You can see one right here on the side locker, another one right here on, the, on that other storage bin, and the two found right here on the front. Let's compare that with the Dragon. So the Dragon piece is all separate moldings and because of that you're able to get this type of detailing that we have here. You see on the fender supports how we have the holes that are integrally molded in. This is far superior compared to the original one here that again traces its roots back to 1970. Note on this one here you can see all the holes that are present. Right over here it's a little tricky to get in, in light but this one here it's definitely much more appreciated here on the Dragon compared to the older Tamiya Thule one. And again, you can see just how much more detail fidelity this one has over the older counterpart. So that definitely is a point on the Dragon. Another area where the Dragon is superior is with the headlight mounts that we have right here. The headlight mount itself is actually like a piece of angle iron 
and that detailing is present right here on the stock dragon component. And you could also see that it has the bracket support right over there with the boss and faster details integrally molded on. The Academy, that's not the case. These brush guards here are exactly as they were when the kit was originally designed in 1970. And they do not have that angle iron feature found on them. They also don't have that little strut that we have here. The reason why it's on mine is again, I went ahead and scratch pulled that out of some plastruct. Another location where you can have the two spar is with the front toe shackles. Here you can see the toe shackle here on the Academy. Now, this is the improved version with the adjusted geometry as well as with that hole that's integrally molded in. And it does a good job with replicating the component. On the Dragon counterpart, it is absent the toe shackle. However, you can see that the piece does have the appropriate geometry found on this bit of equipment. Another place where the Dragon is far superior to the Academy is with the lower hull. Here you can see the torsion bar mounts. They have the appropriate geometry to them. They have the axis cap with the faster details as well as with all the other uh, bits of geometry which would be present on these locations over here. Not to mention they have the appropriate design for the escape hatch and also the other bits of equipment that would be present on the lower portion of the M60's hull. The Academy this is something that is definitely showing its age. So here you can see the torsion bar mounts right over here. Very, very simplistic. Do they do the job? Absolutely. Are they as detailed as the Dragon? Absolutely not. Unlike the Dragon where these are separate components, these are integrally molded on. And the faster details on them are a product of their era. They're somewhat soft in their overall detailing. They definitely do not have the flange detailing which would be present on the real one. And the axis cap section is completely absent on the stock kit. The escape patch over here, you can see some rivets on it. Now, from what I understand, the escape hatch on these M60s are actually an oval type shape, but I'm pretty sure that they may be some round, rounder ones depending on the era that the vehicle was manufactured in. A little hazy on this. I'm pretty sure some M60 guy out there will definitely point me in the right direction. However, you can still see that the lower hull is vastly simplified compared to the Dragon counterpart. From there brings us to the grills, and this is where the Academy kit does have the edge, admittedly. On the Dragon one here, the exhaust manifold has this little extending shelf that we have in this section over here, and this shelf is more indicative of something that you would see on an M48 Patton, and not something from the M60 series. While on the Academy, or again, the older Tamiya tooling kit, that's not present, and this technically is more correct. But then when we start moving up, we'll see some other interesting quirks, like for instance, over here on the fasteners that can that mount the top plate to the hull itself is just a flat little section over here where you have some detailing in this area on the dragon kit this is more prototypical to the real vehicle where we have this would would be a, a a casted in or welded on boss mounted on the hull and then the flange section would just simply bolt on top with the fasteners so in this area here the dragon one is better on the tin work there are no little amenities such as tie down points or other sort of little bits of equipment and this is a carryover found on the academy from the older m60 kit from again the other generations as far as i know i believe this one here is more accurate from the examples of m60 a2s that i saw on the internet but if anyone does have any other info to chime in be sure to do that, so I can't really say on which one has the upper hand in that regard, but regardless, from what I've seen, I believe the Dragon one does have the upper hand in that type of setup. Not that it's important in the grand scheme of things, but it's just a data point I wanted to mention. On the top portion here, we have that divot found on the top stamping for the travel lock. As I mentioned earlier, there is no travel lock fit in place. However, the divot would still be present. And this is where the Dragon does have the edge. On the real M60, there isn't really any sort of a lip like we see right over here. And it tends to look more like the example here on the Dragon. Now, there is a small little like embossed lump in this section, but it's not nearly as pronounced as it is on the Tamiya. So this is one of those areas where I believe the AFV Club one trumps them all, but that's probably true for the entire vehicle. As for the two examples that we have going mono a mono, I'll definitely probably 
lean on the Dragon one as opposed to the Tamiya or the Academy. But regardless, both of them, again, will build into a nice example. As for the remainder of the engine grill detailing, it's a wash. The two are basically identical one per one in this regard. However, one area where the Dragon one is better is with the air intakes for the air filtration boxes. On the Dragon kit, these are separate molded parts, and when you glue them on, you get the type of appearance that we have here. In comparison, the Academy one had these sections integrally molded on, and as you can see, this does lend itself for some softer overall detailing compared to having it as a separate part. Another area where the Dragon is superior is with the bow periscopes. These are separate sections that are actually molded in clear plastic, as are the headlights themselves, and this, again, lends itself for greater accuracy. On the Academy one, it's copy and paste from 1970 tooling, where we have the standard opaque plastic uh, headlights, which is nothing wrong with that. They work perfectly fine, arguably are a wash with the Dragon ones, give or take. But the one area that you really can't refute or argue about are the periscopes. Here we have the three periscopes. They, two of them are molded in the closed state, no biggie. But the, first, the one in the middle is molded in the open state, and it is a hollow piece. As you see, there's absolutely nothing over here, no lens detailing or anything of the sort. Again, this is indicative of something from 1970s tooling. As opposed to the Dragon, yet again, definitely more appropriately with its overall rendering. Not to mention on the Dragon, we do have that little access cap right over here that's next to the heater exhaust manifold. And this detailing is absent on the Academy tooling, as is both the breather valves for the heaters. Those are also absent. I'm not sure if the A2 gets that, but generally on the M60A1 and also on the M60, there would be that breather valve. Found this section over here with that really cool shape and geometry to it, and that is absent on both of these examples. Moving upper brings us to the turret, and in my opinion, it's a wash. Both of them are great in the exact same locations. Geometry-wise, both of them are basically on point. Detail-wise, both of them on point. And also detail fidelity, both of them are basically a one-for-one -one exchange. The one area where the Academy kit arguably has a slightly different edge, but it's more or less just a different style, is with the tarplin. The Dragon kit does not have the tarplin rendered in place, but the Academy kit does. However, if you want to roll with the Academy kit without the tarplin, this is where the Dragon kit is actually superior because it does have all the appropriate detailing out of the box and no other scratch building is required. And this type of detailing would have to be done by the builder if you're going to render the Academy in that format. So although it's, you know, it's basically again a wash in my opinion. As for the the main armament, both of them again, exactly the same in terms of quality. Although I will say that the Academy one does have an edge in that it gives you two options. You could go with the later pattern or the earlier pattern like I did over here. But Dragon didn't rest on their laurels and they did go ahead and release a batch of these kits recently that gives you an aluminum barrel with this profile. So again, the playing fields have basically been leveled in that regard. Moving towards the back of the tar takes to the gypsy rack and in this location here, the two kits are again a wash. They both are almost identical in detail fidelity, complexity, and also with just how overall excellent the final outcome is if you can get the units properly assembled. The geometry on both of the sections are, again, on par with one another, and the level of photo etch on the meshwork is also, again, practically identical. However, this is where the Academy does have an edge over the Dragon, in that the Academy kit does give you more photo etch for the other various details that I touched upon before, namely sections on the searchlight, as well as also there are some sections of PE for the hatch and visor sections, where you have a little flange with some fasteners on them. This is a nice little addition found on the Academy and is absent on the Dragon, but the Dragon does have these details integrally molded into the plastic. So again, even though it doesn't have that PE, it still has that detailing present. The other thing that is absent on both examples are the tow cable clips that are found on the sides of the turret. On both examples over here, that detailing was something that I had to have scratch built. So again, this is a location where the two kits are pretty much identical. The one thing I do want to mention and I'm probably going to give points to the Academy on this one are with the smoke grenade launchers. They seem to be just a little bit more appropriately scaled and rendered compared to the ones on the Dragon. Detail wise, the two are pretty much identical in the overall look, feel, and shape. Just I believe that the Academy one is just, uh, is just better in a slight amount of manner. But again, the two will both 
be able to be used interchangeably and you should have some excellent results. The one area where, again, the Academy Kit does fall short is with the absence of the antenna base. The Dragon Kit gives you the detailing fresh out of the box. And like I mentioned before, this is a crucial bit of detailing, and it's one that, if it's absent, it's just going to hurt the look of the model. And with the Academy Kit, in order to fully flesh it out, this is something that you are going to have to leave the confines of the kit for in order just to get the model built to its standard configuration. Moving to the cupolas, again, the two are basically a wash. In my opinion, the quality on both of them are identical to one another, and the detailing that's found on both are basically a one per one cut punch. The Dragon one does not have the ability for the periscope to be functional, and that you can't flip it down. This is a feature found on the Academy, so that's one aspect where the Academy is better. However, the Dragon does have some very nice detailing found in this section over here, where we have these rails in place where the tarpaulin would be plugged in. And on the Academy example, it's a little bit softer in detailing, only by slightly, but it is admittedly better or better pronounced found on the Dragon example. The Dragon example also renders this unit without the tarpaulin in place, while the Academy one has the thing default with the tarpaulin in place. So again, if you're going to render your model and you want to have the tarpaulin, you're going to want to lean for the Academy, as opposed to if you want to specifically build a model without the tarpaulin, roll with the Dragon. Both examples did not have the shell ejection port section drilled out. On this one here, I actually hollowed out with a Dremel. It appears that I did that a while ago when I built this model. While on the Academy one, that's just not the case. In terms of the 50 cal or the uh, M85, both of them are I, almost identical in terms of quality and both are very excellently rendered out of the box. The next thing I do want to mention, which is an important bit of detailing, is the searchlight. So the Xenon searchlight I already talked upon and mentioned earlier in this video, and it does come out very, very well. And here we have the Dragon counterpart for reference. Both searchlights are difficult in their own right to put together. The Dragon one, with the way it's designed, it's very similar to the Academy one, where you have a center seam to contend with, and it's also a pain in the ass to deal with that seam because of the handles in the way, and you have to do some clever tricks in order to get around it. However, I will say that the Dragon, I prefer that version because of the lens, where it does just come out a bit nicer compared to the Academy, where you do have to do a little bit more hand fitting and finesse in order to get the unit to come out. Obviously I was able to pull it off on this model, but if, between the two, I do prefer the Dragon one in that regard. Both kits, uh, by the way, do not give you the main power cord, and this is a bit of detail that needs to be scratch built by the builder, as I've touched upon in this video and also in the Starship video as well. Of course, though, the biggest thing where the Dragon One not only trumps the Academy, but basically curb stomps it into oblivion is with the tracks. No bones about it. This kid here has a superior track. The DS Styrene patent tracks are excellent. I absolutely love these tracks. I love DS Styrene tracks in general, and anyone who says otherwise honestly doesn't know what the hell they're talking about, because these tracks are absolutely awesome. They have the appropriate detailing on them. This is what I was referring to before, where we have this deep rubber pad for the chevron and it's nice and pronounced and on the stock academy one it was almost like half the thickness of this one here and just the overall quality on the remainder of the skeletal structure and the teeth are just sublime these tracks are just probably the best single piece vinyl tracks for an m60 or patent based vehicle that are on the market sadly they don't sell as an aftermarket piece but it shouldn't be too hard to track a single loose set down on ebay i have utilized this track before as i mentioned before on a another m60 a1 build that i did a little while ago for commission and it went on the tamiya kit without any sort of problem so if you are working on the academy i would recommend leveling up to the ds styrene tracks or any other track alternative as i mentioned before because the stock ones are just pure junk Oddly enough, if Academy were just to throw in an extra pair of single-piece vinyl tracks, even the octagonal link ones, we would really be probably having a slightly different discussion than we are right now. But between the two, just, you know, mono a mono, out of the box versus out of the box, the Dragon one definitely has a ginormous advantage in that respect. The very last thing that I do want to mention is the overall size. The Academy one is slightly longer compared to the Dragon. Hopefully it could pop out right here or it's more visible here. The two rear fender sections are aligned and you can see that the Academy one is just longer by a smidge. As for which one's more accurate, this is again, it's kind of hard to say. One thing you do have to factor in is again, this 
size here of this model is a carryover from the original 1970 Tamiya tooling. And during that era, Tamiya was known to slightly bump up and fudge the scales on their 135th scale kits in order to make the models better able to fit a gearbox as well as also their batteries. So this is something that has been seen on a large number of the older kits from that generation. And since they basically just kept this tooling, in production, you know, since that era, this is something that can possibly be a carryover from then. So if you're comparing the two and you say, oh, well, this one's underscaled, eh, perhaps that's not the case. And perhaps, you know, it might be the other one that is slightly overscaled. So because of that, I can't really say heads or tails. I will say that size wise, the two are again, basically comparable and you can have the two in your collection or in a diorama and no one's really gonna bat an eye or, or, and or know a difference. And before we go ahead and go to the next scene, I do want to take the opportunity to say that what you see on the table are only two of the four examples of the M60A2 Starship that are on the market in 135th scale. The other one, which I would love to put in this section over here uh, if I had one on hand that was completed, is the old school Tamiya kit that dates back to 1974. Obviously that kit's going to have some deficiencies to it because of the age of the tooling, but it's still built into a really cool example of the M60A2 nonetheless. And the other one, or I should say the other two examples are from AFV Club. AFV Club went ahead and tooled up their own M60A2 Starship, utilizing their excellent M60A1 tooling, but you know, revising it, giving it the A2 uh, components. And they have two options available, the early and the late, and they are sold as two separate kits. I would love to acquire both of those, add them to the collection, and then, you know, who knows, maybe I could have a nice proper shootout video between all the examples of the M60A2. But this is something that, you know, will probably be discussed and revisited down the road. And after all of that, at the end of the day, I am still thrilled in how this build turned out, and honestly, I couldn't imagine turning out any better. This build was a blast to work on from start to finish, even though I do have my opinions on several of the design cues on this kit. Would, even with all that factored in, this model still built into an excellent representation of an M60A2 Starship, and it's definitely a viable option that is on the market. And if you stuck around to this point in the video, I want to say thank you. Obviously, I must have been keeping your attention preoccupied to, you know, keep with me all this time. And this is the perfect point to pivot us into skill level and recommendation. So right off the bat, would you recommend, or I should say, would I recommend this kit for someone who's a beginner? Absolutely not. Even though the model is technically very easily built from the suspension all the way up, a beginner can theoretically put it together. Where a beginner is going to have difficulty with is one with the track. The track is definitely, you know, forget about the track being remotely easy, but I, I wouldn't recommend the track for anybody because, you know, I, Lincoln Lincoln is just trash. But the real uh, hurdle for this kit being built by a beginner is indeed the gypsy rack. That was so fiddly, so finely molded, and just the amount of hand fitting and tweaking and bending and just, you know, getting everything in its proper place was something that a beginner is absolutely not going to have the stomach for. It's just not going to be played out very well in the cards. If you're a beginner and you're looking for an M60A2 Starship, honestly, get the Tamiya one. The Tamiya one is going to be probably your best bet at getting an M60A2, being able to build the thing and actually complete it and have it look, by the most part, pretty good. This model here is definitely going to be for someone that's going to be leveling up. So if you are an intermediate to an advanced range builder, those are the type of individuals I would recommend this kit to. By the time someone is an intermediate builder, they should have the skills levels in order to deal with the finely molded bits found on the gypsy rack, as well as also with dealing with the photo etch. The remainder of the build is something that can easily be tackled with, you know, some pretty good results, specifically again, by the time you are at that intermediate level. The other kit, or I should say the other portions of the kit aside from the gypsy rack, go together in a breeze. You know, it's just a standard Tamiya or a Academy pattern M60. So roughly in about, you know, an afternoon or so, you should have the majority of the kit assembled, said, and done. The hardest part, again, is the gypsy rack. But by the time someone is an intermediate builder, this is something like you're looking to challenge yourself, but you don't want to overstretch yourself in comparison to some of the other kits on the market. Something from like Mini Art comes to mind, where those kits are, you know, 
excellently detailed. However, whoa, you're going to be really, really pacing yourself on one of those. This kit over here, it's like a nice entry level into like super kit status, but you do have the majority of the kit being something that can readily be built and be built with, you know, fairly amount of ease. And that's why this kit here is really more or less intended for that type of an individual. If you're an advanced builder, by all means, this type of kit you can put together with your eyes closed for the most part. And the gypsy rack is something that it, someone with advanced skill sets should be able to navigate around and have a, a final outcome that closely resembles like the example I have here. But of course I am gonna beat the dead horse. No matter your skill set, for the love of God, swap out the kit tracks with something workable or a single piece of vinyl. The kit tracks are just trash, in my opinion, and just the build will be a thousand times better if you just swap those out with those other alternatives that I just mentioned. Although the kit is pretty detailed out of the box, it does have those shortcomings that I touched upon before, and many of these shortcomings can be solved with several of the aftermarket solutions that are on the market. At the end of the day, this kit is nothing more than a standard Tamiya or an Academy M60A1. And because of that, there are a plethora of aftermarket solutions that are available. Besides different type of tracks, we also have several pieces, or I should say several upgrade sets that supply components in Photo Etch, Cast Resin, as well as even in 3D Print. All of those upgrades can be added to this model over here to carry it from the stock kit condition that you see presently on the table. But again, is something like that worth it in the end, specifically when you have the other competitors on the market, be it from Dragon or from AFV Club? Uh, that's something that's really going to depend on the personal discretion of the builder at hand. But if you do have like a spare set of those components lying around, yeah, they could be sprinkled on one of these kits here and you could just, you know, carry it off from the kit counterpart. But even in its kit configuration, sans the tracks, and also sans the antenna base that you are gonna need, you can still build it out of the box and have some excellent results. And really there's nothing more that needs to be said about that and this pivots directly into recommendations. First and foremost, if anyone is a fan of Cold War era armor, the M60A2 here from Academy is an exquisite addition to add to your collection. If you're the type of person that has the M60A1, the T72, or the T64, to name a few, the Starship here would fit into that collection like a nice little puzzle piece. Another person who should be a no-brainer who I would recommend this kit to would be anyone who's an avid fan of the Patton family of vehicles. If you got, again, the M60A1, the M48A3, the A2, all those patents that are in the lineup, the A2 here will again just click directly into that type of collection, almost as good as like clicking together a Lego brick. Another person I recommend this kit to would be anyone who's into converting static models into radio controlled. Because this vehicle here at its heart is the Academy, or and also <laughs> by association, the Tamiya M60A1, this model here can be converted to not just motorized like I've done here, but you can RC convert it. As I stated before, there is an individual on YouTube that did exactly that with this exact same kit. And if you are the type of person that are into those modifications and upgrades, the Starship kit here is a phenomenal choice for you. Academy basically only change the track design as well as the sprocket design in order to make this thing as a static model configuration. If you just make the modifications that I touched upon in this video, it doesn't take too much work to swap it over and make it into a, a functional model. Because the upper and lower hulls were originally designed to be motorized from the get-go back in 1970, they have all the provisions required in order to be able to secure in place as well as open so you get access to the interior. And with the way, again, I gotta give credit to Academy for this, with the way Academy designed the rear engine deck, they designed in a way to still utilize the original motorization clip that secures the, the rear portion of the top deck in place. Because of that, this really immensely simplifies the amount of work that needs to be done by the builder in order to fully convert. This luxury is just not present with the other kits on the market, namely the Dragon or the AFV Club counterparts. Yet another person I'd recommend this kit to would be anyone who has the old school Tamiya one. 
It's kind of interesting that this kit is really nothing more than a level up from that old school Tamiya kit. And if you have the old school Tamiya one, this kit here is basically very similar in its construction. Again, you do have most of the lower hull components that are very similar, but you also get to appreciate the much nicer, newer tooling that's present on the turret components. And it'll be kind of cool to have the uh, old and new format of the two kits side by side in the collection. I mean, that's something that I'm going to be doing personally, but you know, that's something for another video for another day. If anyone's watching this and are wondering to themselves, would this make a good uh, diorama candidate? And the answer is also yes, this would make a nice candidate for a diorama. The M62 Starship is, has such a bizarre, unique shape to it that it does lend itself for some potential very interesting diorama scenes. Even though this is a Cold Warrior and it was never actually used in combat, it would still have some pretty interesting scenes that could be cobbled together by the person who, you know, has a nice, clever imagination. And yet another person I'd recommend this kit to would be anybody who is a fan of building and collecting kits from Tamiya as well as Academy. Academy should be a no-brainer, but also Tamiya kits. This kit is basically nothing more than a cousin of the Tamiya tooling. And if you have a Tamiya tank collection, the addition to this one here, much along the lines like I mentioned before, would fit in very, very well and very comfortably. And with that, that wraps up this model showcase video for this 135th scale M60A2 Starship. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posted content, being small scale model showcase videos like this one over here, or the other larger scale project update videos that frequently get posted to this channel. Another way to keep in loop new posted content is by liking us on Facebook. There, I have more photographs of this particular build, as well as the other smaller and larger scale builds that have been seen on this channel in the past. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by EastCoastArmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Thanks again. I'll be seeing you all again on the next one. Till then.